welcome to a new week of Unsolved No More. Today's Monday, so solve or unsolved, what new case are we getting today? Today we're getting the unsolved case of homicide in Bellingham, Massachusetts from December 4th, 1978. This is the case of Teresa Corley. Now, for those of you who have read my book, Unsolved No More, this case is highlighted in that. This is a very uh, complex case, especially if you make it that way. I did an original assessment of this, which I provided to the family, and specifically Teresa's sister, Jerry, who... I reached out to, as I always do in these cases, to make sure that it's okay that I do the case and talk about the case uh, because victims and victims' families are always foremost for me. And if she would have said no, we wouldn't have done it. I went on to another case. But we've had contact now for a number of years about the case, and there's been some new developments. In the case since I did my assessment oh how long ago was that 2016 so we'll talk about that <clears throat> we'll go over victimology which is always very important and in this specific case I got a lot of victimology because I had the family fill out a victimology form which I ask a bunch of questions and they answer and it gives me, you know, something to go on because when you know victimology, you'll know if the victim would fight or flight in any given circumstance. And that's going to be very important in this case. So again, this case is from 1978. Forensics is going to play a key role because back then, obviously, we didn't have DNA, right? Uh, it was just the start of criminal profiling. So the case has developed through the years with the advances of all of that. Which, in turn, makes, you know, for updates. In which we will have. So the synopsis of this case is... That a 19-year-old Teresa Corley started her day on December 4th, 1978 by working. And she worked at a place called Penthouse Sales. Now, in my original assessment, and probably even after I get through reviewing this again this week, that place of employment played a key role in my assessment. She worked from around 3 to 7, and then she eventually goes out that night. She goes out that night and meets her boyfriend at a bar called The Train Stop. While there, she gets into an argument and a fight with the boyfriend, and she leaves. And she leaves on foot. Then she's intoxicated. And the next thing you know, she's picked up by a car full of young white males who may or may not had nefarious activities on their mind. Teresa knew at least one of the people for, for sure in the car and they said they were going to a party. She decided to go with. So she went to this party in a different part of town that was called the Presidential Arms Apartment Buildings. She is there for a number of hours. You know, what happens during those number of hours is a very conflicting report. There was at least four, five, maybe six individuals, all males, at this party. 
Teresa probably did not feel comfortable at that party. At some point in time, I know she didn't feel comfortable there. Depending on whose statement you believe from that party, Teresa either was sexually assaulted by one or more individuals, or it was a consensual activity between her and at least one or maybe several of the individuals, depending on who you believe. Now, victimology, again, will play a key role in this in order to determine who's telling the truth there. But yet, it gets more <laughs> convoluted than that because she ends up leaving that apartment and that party on foot by herself. And remember, weather always plays a key role. And we'll talk about the weather during that night. She is seen by a, I believe, a dairy truck driver early in the morning who is finishing up his milk routes. So we're talking about 4 o'clock in the morning, 4.30. And we'll dive deeper into these timelines and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll know for sure and let you guys know what the times are. But again, this is just a synopsis. That truck driver gives her a ride to his employment. She's trying to get home. If you follow the apartment to where the dairy truck driver's employment is. And from there, she is picked up by another truck driver from that same company. And is taken, I want to say a half a mile, if that, from her home. And she's dropped off right in front of a police station. Yet, being a half a mile from her house, 5.30 in the morning, she never made it home. Her body is found three days later, December 8th, off of Interstate 495 which is a major highway, approximately a couple miles from where she was last seen in front of that police station. She is wearing two different types of shoes, one of hers, one a male shoe from that apartment. She is found naked some of her clothing found with her, next to her. Some of her clothing never found. An autopsy report shows she was strangled to death by a thin ligature. Remember that. Advances in DNA technology will play a role in this in the year 2020. Maybe 2021. The body of Teresa Corley was exhumed last year where advanced testing could be done. And this case is still unsolved. So a lot of moving parts in this case. You have a group of guys from that presidential arms apartment who may or may not have sexually assaulted this victim. But that same night, within a couple hours, she's murdered. Coincidence?
It should also be noted that during this time frame, there was at least, I believe, 17 murders. Let me look here. No. 9 18 murders within 50 miles between New Bedford and Bellingham, Massachusetts during this time. Ranging from the age of 14 to 30. All young females. A lot of them found dumped off a highway in Bedford, Massachusetts. So this case probably more than any other case that I've been consulted on that wasn't really one of my own but I was hired to consult on it made me think more than any other case because you have so many different scenarios in this you don't have a crime scene but you do have a body dump location that could be a crime scene too but being off of a major highway early in the morning probably between well, 5.30 and 6 a.m. 6.30 a.m. maybe. People are going to work. It's a weekday. The many scenarios that could have taken place. Teresa got in a fight that night with her boyfriend. She was mad that he was talking to another female. You have that scenario. She leaves in an anger, in a jealousy, goes to a party with a bunch of guys. There is no doubt some sexual activity took place. She leaves in such a huff that she has two different shoes on. Could have been because of intoxication, could have been because she was angry, could have been that she was scared and running. She makes her way from that apartment where she's picked up by two different truck drivers that drop her off right in front of a police station around 5 a.m. She's when she's within a half a mile from making it home. But there's something else. There's something else that played into my assessment the first time around. There was a restaurant called Maria's, right where she was dropped off at. That restaurant opened up at 5 a.m. That's all I'm going to say about that until tomorrow. But she's half a half a mile. Maybe even not a half a mile. It might have been less than that. From home. She was sexually assaulted. Dropped off. Police station's right there. What happened? That's what we got to figure out. There's been a lot of interviews. There has been a family. That won't give up. And that's what I admire most about these victims' family members. The fact that they won't give up. Remember, that's the definition of a champion. A champion is somebody who just refuses to stay down. Teresa's family refuses to stay down. Very respectful, but will speak their mind to get justice. And that's what it counts. That's what's important. So, 
although I know this case <clears throat> very well, there's a lot more to go over. And I poured over it five years ago. But I have to pour over it again and again and again until you know it like the back of your hand. So with the family's permission, I'm going to present the case to you once again. I'm going to give you my assessment from five years ago and see if I still maintain that. If I still believe that because I'm very sure of that assessment in the past. But am I still? We'll get into that. We'll also get into if we can tell whether it's an organized or disorganized offender. Whether she knew this individual or whether not. And we're also going to get into the key clue tomorrow. Something that has to do with that restaurant. Possible. It's something... That was found during an autopsy. However, we're going by the word of the victim's family. We don't have the actual autopsy report where, where it shows what I mean. And if that's the case, what do you believe? And we'll get into that key clue tomorrow because trust me, it's the biggest key clue, I think, in this case. It, it changes everything. Possibly. So, that's it for Monday's Solved or Unsolved. The Unsolved Murder of Teresa Corley. We're going to get into it. Stay tuned all week. Okay, so tomorrow we're going to do my key clue. We're going to talk about that. And then Wednesday's the deep dive. We're going to get into the suspects. We're going to get into... A criminal profile if it's warranted, crime scene assessment, body dump locations, victimology, suspectology. We're going to have to deduce from possibilities of all these offenders to probabilities. And what do we believe? I can guarantee you it's going to be one of three things, okay? Suspect wise, you know, and that's what we're going to go off of. I'll present that. Then you guys can make up your decision, and you may agree with me, you may disagree with me. And as always, that's okay. I'm never going to proclaim to be 100% right unless I say it. If I say, hey, I'm 100% sure, but that's very rare. Uh, you can always be fallible. You know, we're, we are human, and if different things come available, things change. Assessments could change. We don't know everything that the police know. Okay, especially in this, there's contradicting testimony by the first officer on scene that discovered the body as to how she was found. And this is very important. You know, in one statement, he says she was displayed, spread eagled. The next one, she was face down, had clothes on. What? Well, that's a big change. Okay, especially when trying to determine whether the offender's organized or disorganized and what you're looking for. That's huge. So, we've got to look into that as well. All these discrepancies. Again, the police know everything. Okay? It's my opinion, by following this case, it seems like most, if not all of the police investigators involved in this, truly do care, and they are doing a good job in progressing us. And of course, I think it helps that the family members are pressing them. But they're being respectful doing it. And as long as you are like that and you do that, I think it keeps the fire going and they keep working it. But as you know, if the investigators are doing a bad job, I will say such. I'm not, I'm not timid in that area. But when they're doing a good job, you know, I'll tell them. I've been in that situation, you know, so I empathize with them. However, I empathize with the families even more, always. 
So we'll get into that this week. So this is it for solved or unsolved this week's case, Teresa Corley. Stay tuned the rest of the week until we figure out what we're going to do. Remember, Wednesday's the deep dive. Thursday, we're going to go live and we're going to talk about all of this. And then Friday is your Q&A session and we'll get that out. So this week, stay tuned for solved or unsolved Teresa Corley on Unsolved No More. Mains out. Okay, welcome to Tuesday. Tuesday we have Ken's key clue. And although there's a lot of clues in this case, you know, the ligature type marks on Teresa's neck is is definitely a key clue. Okay. In addition, the way her body was found naked is obviously a key clue. The body dump location off of a major highway is a very key clue, especially in my first assessment. There, there's no doubt that that played a major role. But what I'm about to tell you now, to me, is the biggest key clue. And that is quaaludes and eggs. Now what does that have to do with anything? <clears throat> well, according to three... So not one, not two, three of Teresa's siblings, they recall being told that during the autopsy, Teresa was found with quaaludes and undigested eggs in her stomach. Now, why is that a key clue? She's at the train stop restaurant. At 10 o'clock at night, or whenever she was there during that time frame, late at night. Well, to me, it's late at night. Some some people might think that's early to be out. Uh, then she goes to the Presidential Arms apartment building with those individuals. And they, she's there for a good amount of time, till at least 4 in the morning, 4.30 in the morning. And she leaves out of there in a huff, as we talked about yesterday. And then she is taken by the truck drivers in front of the police station. Now, again, why the police station? Was she going to report a sexual assault? She never did. But somewhere between that time, she had to have eaten eggs. Now, from what I understand in my research... It takes, I think I have it written down somewhere, six to eight hours for your food to pass through your stomach and your small intestine. So that means she had to have eaten between 10 o'clock on December 5th and December 8th when her body was found. Now granted, if she was held captive for two days and was fed by her kidnappers, well, that changes the whole dynamics, you know what I mean? She could have ate on the 7th or the 8th, but that didn't happen. She was killed December 5th. Um, so that means that she would have had to have eaten the eggs between 10 p.m. on December 4th and 5.30 a.m. on December 5th. Now, during those times, she was at the train stop restaurant or bar and the Presidential Academy Apartments. That's the only places that we know that she was. So where did she get those eggs? She surely wouldn't have been eating eggs at the train stop while she was drinking alcohol, right? So you could probably rule that out. At the party, it is possible that she ate eggs at that party, right? No one ever said that. And none of the people that were ever interviewed there said that. Now, maybe they weren't asked that question. Maybe this whole quaalude and eggs key clue is irrelevant. Maybe somehow it got mixed up, right? That... Because we don't have any autopsy report to show that conclusively. So normally, 
I wouldn't even consider it in an assessment. Yet this is so powerful that three of the siblings remember that. Why would they remember that if it wasn't true? So if that's the case, where did she get the quaaludes and eggs? Well, the quaaludes is pretty significant. It's why victimology is important. Her victimology shows that she didn't do drugs. Now, she was very intoxicated that night by all accounts. Could she have tried it for the first time? Absolutely. She's 19. Okay. Could she have been drugged? Absolutely. Could somebody at the Presidential Academy Apartments made her eggs because she was hungry and put quaaludes in it? Certainly. Wouldn't be the first time. But yet, there's no indication that she had eggs at that apartment. And according to everybody's account, she was not comfortable there. There was no other girls there. There was only guys. She realized that when she got there, that things just... She didn't want to be there. She made a statement after she went into the bedroom to lay down or we don't really know why she went into that bedroom. But when she went into that bedroom, one or more individuals went in there to have sex with her to the point where she came out and made the statement, if you guys just let me leave, I'll have sex with all of you. Now, do we believe that statement? I mean, that's up for interpretation, right? But somebody that was interviewed, that was there, said she said that. Again, she leaves. Doesn't sound like somebody to me that's going to be eating any, anything there. Especially eggs. But remember where she was dropped off at by the two truck drivers. First truck, truck driver, and I think the, the name is Garlic truck driver, took her to the entrance of his employees. And then he was coming back from a delivery and a truck's going out. And the truck that's going out picks her up and drops her off at in front of the police station, in front of... Uh, I believe a Dairy Queen restaurant was there at the time. But remember, Maria's restaurant, remember I said that yesterday, is also there. According to my research, Maria's restaurant opened up at 5 a.m. It's cold out. It's December. In Massachusetts, the truck driver that picked her up said, she told the police she was intoxicated and she was cold. Now she's a half a mile from home. Why not just go home? There's only one person that can answer that, and that's Teresa. But we still have an unquestioned topic and that is eggs. That restaurant's right there. It's warm. She's hungry. Does she go into Maria's restaurant and eat those eggs? In my original assessment, I said yes. That made the most sense to me. And I'm going to stick with that assessment if the three siblings are right and those eggs and quaaludes were found in her stomach during autopsy. If not, we could go another route. But did something take place in that restaurant? Did she catch the eye of somebody in that restaurant? 
at 5 o'clock in the morning before she made it home. She's last seen walking in front of the Dairy Queen, I believe, and I want to double check this. Now, as you know, tomorrow I'll have all this down to a T, but this is so important that I want to make sure <clears throat> that we got this right. Oh man, the more I look through this, there's so many there's so many different scenarios and different people that are involved. This reminds me a lot of Gail Matthews case where there's so many moving parts and so many different people that are suspects that it gets convoluted if you let it get convoluted to you which I'm trying not to do but she's last seen by a group of individuals that are carpooling on their way to work but I want to find out exactly where that was so that way you guys know so I'm gonna pause this until I figured it out okay so Teresa is observed by three men carpooling to work at the General Motors plant. She's walking past the Dairy Queen towards Hartford Avenue. This is the last known sighting of Teresa. So she gets dropped off by the second driver, truck driver from Garrelix. She drops her off, he drops her off in front of the police station at the intersection of Route 40 and 126 at 5 a.m. She's next seen at 5.30 walking in that area towards her house. So you have a, about a 30 minute gap there. To me, that falls in line with possibly her going into the Maria's restaurant and eating. Now, I would have hoped that police at the time would have put that together. You know, if I'd have been an investigator at the time, I would have got the autopsy reports and I would have questioned the eggs. And then I would have went to Maria's restaurant and started questioning everybody there. We don't know whether the police did that. We don't Because we don't even know that it's true. But I guarantee you, the three siblings are not making that up. Teresa's siblings are not making that up. They heard that somewhere. So, <clears throat> it's 5.30 in the morning. She's observed by these three guys going to work. Now, I know a lot of people are going to jump on that and say, well, have, they, were they checked out? I'm sure they were. I don't have any information that they were. Um, but they were going to work. So, I guess all you have to do is check their time cards and make sure that they were there. She's so close to home, and it's starting to get daylight out, but she doesn't make it home. Do those individuals from the Academy uh, academy Apartments, that's just like Don Miller, Presidential Arms, are they coming to look for her? Some of their statements, they say yes. There was an individual or two that went and looked for her. So, or did she catch somebody's eye in that restaurant who had nefarious activities on his mind? My original assessment was that somebody was in that restaurant. Because I couple that with the 18 other murders around that area that were found off of an interstate where Teresa was found. But man, you're telling me that it's that bad of a coincidence that she is sexually assaulted 
by some people's accounts that were even there. Some people that were even there said she was sexually assaulted. But other people there said, no, she, it was consensual. But all this bad is happening to her. And it's just her unlucky day at Maria's restaurant where a serial killer picks her up at 5.30 in the morning. I don't know if I believe that anymore. I, I don't know. Now, the ligature has me concerned, and I'll get into that tomorrow in the deep dive. But usually coincidences I don't know this is a tough one to figure out but those quaaludes and eggs that's a key clue key clue to at least where she was the last time that she was seen between 5 and 5.30 gap how does she get her get the eggs in her stomach? Now, is it possible that she had eggs that morning and it's still in her system? Again, I'm not a medical expert. I'm going by my research that says that that's not possible. Yet, victimology would tell you that. What did she eat for breakfast? Did you guys have eggs in the house? That could eliminate that question right then and there. That's why the most mundane things that you think are not even relevant, and you think, well, I'm not even going to ask the family this because it makes no sense. What does it matter what she had for breakfast the day before? Well, now you know why it's important. I had said yesterday... It's important to know that where she worked. Penthouse sales. Now, I had to look up to see what they did. You know, penthouse sales. You, some of you might think, oh, like Playboy, penthouse. No, not that. Penthouse sales made, from what I understand, either a wire rope or a rope clothesline type of rope. Why is that important? That's right. The small, thin ligature that she was strangled with. So I'm sure some of you guys have gone to my book already and read this chapter and know what I'm thinking. And for good reason. Very confident about that, that assessment. However, there's also an alternate theory that certainly is a lot simpler. And that is people from those apartments followed her to make sure she didn't talk. But if that's the case, if they already sexually assaulted her, why she found naked? Did they sexually assault her again? Very possible. So again, a lot of dynamics, a lot of moving parts here. But we're going to try to uh, work through it the best we can. And we'll go from there. So that's my key clue. I hope that made sense to you guys, and I'll talk to you tomorrow for the deep dive. All right, good morning to you. This being Wednesday, the week of a Teresa Corley unsolved homicide, and since it's Wednesday, it's a deep dive. So you already looked at Monday, the overview of the case. You know that I was retained by the family to look at this back in 2016. You also know that I wrote a chapter of it about the case in my book unsolved no more with my assessment and you looked at Tuesday's key clue which was the quaalude and eggs so today we're gonna dive a little deeper into like the timeline the suspects and if my mind has changed 
over the past five years. You know, in five years, I've, I've learned a lot and I've worked with uh, a lot more cases and maybe something has changed, but maybe not. So the first thing that we want to look at in Teresa Corley is her victimology. And I talked a little bit about this earlier in the week. She, w she was a fighter. In that is, she was presented in a light where, or a situation where it was fight or flight, she would fight. <clears throat> That's key. Now, I rarely have a case where there are so many suspects for a low risk victim. You know, a low-risk victim is, you know, maybe a child that's brought up in a healthy environment, in a good neighborhood, uh, with caring parents. That's a, a low-risk victim. Or maybe a nun. Uh, a high-risk victim being a prostitute or a drug user who are always in a, a level of a higher risk of being a victim. Teresa doesn't seem like that at all. And by all accounts, she was safe. She, she wasn't a high-risk victim at all. So why did she become a victim? That's what we have to look at. So through her victimology, she was raised in a, <clears throat> in a tough environment with siblings um, that were older than her, but she integrated well into whatever community she was in. Um, she was not easily intimidated. I'm reading here uh, from a quote from the victimology form that I had them, the family fill out. Uh, she wasn't fearful of falling victim to any type of violent crime. Teresa's family once lived in a predominantly African-American community in the Boston area and then moved to Bellingham. Um, she had a false sense of security because of this. But Bellingham is a small royal town as compared to the area in Boston where they used to live. Uh, Teresa's professional goal was to be a pediatrician. Um, she was enrolled at classes at Holliston Junior College to become a medical assistant. And she had only lived in Bellingham a couple years prior to her death. So... When I look at this victimology form, okay, first off, why, why have somebody fill out that form? Again, you want to know that victim. And I gave many examples of this, so I don't want to rehash it. But <clears throat> it gives you an insight as to what they will do during a given situation. It also tells you, you can start deducing things, maybe not 100%, but... You know, you can you can certainly deduce from possibility to probabilities based strictly on victimology. Now here's an example in this case. So I'm going to read right from my report, you know, what I deduced straight from victimology. So this is my victimology assessment. So what about Teresa's victimology help us, us get closer to solving her murder? We can deduce a number of things just from victimology. Okay, so number one, she would speak to strangers, which leads to her vulnerability to be coaxed into a vehicle of possible abduction. Okay, she was trusting. We can deduce this because of her outgoing nature and the fact she hitchhiked often. She was tough. She believed nothing bad would happen to her, especially as it related to her walking and hitchhiking. She was not a heavy drinker. She did smoke marijuana, but that was the extent of her drug use, and it wasn't extensive. Her small body weight and height, 5'4", 120, would have an effect on her intoxication level when drinking. See, these things you learn from victimology as well, and they play a key role in deducing what happened. Number five, her sexual history indicates only two known partners. If this is true, the account of consensual sex that we're going to encounter later at the presidential arms with multiple partners can be called into question. 
She was attractive in good physical shape and she walked a lot. She may have been a victim of a past sexual assault by a neighbor. That's not confirmed. And she had a good, if not great, relationship with her family and her mother and would call home if in trouble. Now that's, that's eight items that we deduced just from her victimology alone. Do you see how this now can play into the unfolding of this case as we go forward? So... From that victimology, let's jump right to the timeline. Let's jump to, and I want to be specific on this timeline, like I told you that I would be. So, on December 4th, 1978, between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m., Teresa goes to work, and she works at a place called Penthouse Sales. I talked about that earlier in the week. She says that she's going to a party later. Nothing unusual, you know, she's in college, She's 19. No, okay. Now, at some point before going to the bar, she is drinking at a person's house whose name's Jimmy at his apartment. So her intoxication level is starting to, to go. At 10.30, so between 7 and 10.30, Within that time frame, she's already drinking. At 10.30, she arrives at the train stop bar. She's there to celebrate a friend's birthday. This was planned. She's there for an hour till about 11.30. Her boyfriend is there with her. her. His name is Rick. They get into an argument. Now, what is that argument about? Um, he is seen talking to one of his ex-girlfriends there, supposedly, and... There were some jealousy issues there. You know, just like any typical young relationship. Nothing out of the ordinary. But she leaves that bar. Now, this is where some discrepancy comes in. And this is where it hurts not having the police reports. Because I think the police reports would have this fact that we should know. So, we don't know whether she hitchhikes or she's, or she's given a ride. I tend to believe she's given a ride um, to the Academy Arms apartment building. There's documentation that she's picked up by a gentleman named Ronnie. His name is going to be important in this. So remember Ronnie. His brother or relation, I believe it's a brother, Donnie. A gentleman possibly named Michael. And another individual. So you might have three or four individuals in this car that pick her up. She knows at least one of the people in the car, or she, more than likely she wouldn't have got in. But her victimology says maybe she would because she hitchhiked. But she's, she's intoxicated at this point. By all, I, I can't say that because I have, no, I have no documentation, no statements of that at this point. I'm just going by since she's been drinking since 7 o'clock. 7.30, and now it's 11.30, and she wasn't a heavy drinker. She's picked up in front of the Dairy Queen that's located at 21 North Main Street, okay? That's going to be important, too. Regardless of how she gets there, she gets to this party. She's told there's a party at this Presidential Arms apartment building. She is there from, let's, let's just say, 11.45 p.m. to 4 in the morning. Big gap of time, right? Between 4 and 4.30, she leaves the apartment building. Now, there is a discrepancy as to why she leaves. It is suggested that she is angry that a possible sexual assault or a sexual assault attempt is occurring or had occurred but we don't we don't know for sure but what we do know is when she departs she leaves that apartment with mismatched shoes one male shoe and one of her own shoe now see this is something that had to be worked backwards from when the body is discovered 
it's not that simple. The body's discovered, and if you find two different types of shoes, well, you're thinking, well, what's going on? Well, they worked it backwards, and this is where it came from, that apartment building. Now, why? Well, I surmised at the time that it could be, and probably is because of her intoxication level, her haste to leave if she was in a hurry running to get out of there, or simply because it was dark, or a combination of all three, which it probably was. But it's approximately a four-hour window there. That's a long time to be a, at a party that you don't want to be at, right? So between four and five, now that she has left that apartment building, that party, where it was all guys, she's observed sitting on a guardrail between 4 and 5 a.m. on Route 140, and she's picked up by a Garlic Farms truck driver. He drives her to the entrance of his employer, which is at 1199 West Central Street in Franklin, Massachusetts. He drops her off there. She's then picked up by a second Garlic Farms driver who drops her off in front of the police station at the intersection of Route 140 and Route 126. They say she's cold. They say she's intoxicated. That's 5 o'clock. She's dropped off in front of the police station. She makes no mention of reporting a sexual assault to the police or anything, but this is where they drop her off. Now, why there? Why it were... Because she only lived another half mile up. So why did they take her there? Is it because the truck driver was not going another half mile? Was that out of his way? That's something that I think I would want to know, and I don't think I ever got an answer to that. But... At 5.30 a.m., 30 minutes now, probably after she was dropped off, Teresa is observed by three men carpooling to work at the General Motors plant. She's walking past the Dairy Queen, same Dairy Queen that she was picked up in front of, walking towards Hartford Avenue. This is the last known sighting of Teresa alive. This is on December 5th. December 8th, three days later, at 4.30 p.m., a call is placed to the police station about a body being located. The caller identified himself as John Burlington from Connecticut. Police get there. Teresa's body is recovered in a gully off of the northbound lane of Interstate 495. Okay, this John Burlington is going to be a key figure as well as we move forward here. So, now let's talk about the body location. Everybody knows who knows me and watches this channel um, and watched me on the History Channel as well because this was a big deal for me on the History Channel was to always go to a crime scene location. For me, it's paramount. Yet, in this case, there is none. But there is a body dump location. So... It could be a crime scene location, sure, but it appears that it's a body dump location because it's off a major interstate, 495. Now, I didn't have a lot to go on when I first looked at this case, but let me, I'll, just, I'll just read some of the thoughts that I had there. We can tell a lot by this location where Teresa's body was recovered. The location is along the northbound lane of Interstate 495, which is a busy major road, and I already said that. The exact location was approximately 25 to 35 feet down an embankment in a small gully. It appears that she wasn't dumped out of the vehicle. She was dragged or carried to that final resting spot. So, what, what can we tell about that location? I'm trying to think of how I want to frame this, this thought of how, 
why does somebody, I'll frame it as a, a question to you guys. Why does somebody dump a body off a major interstate? I mean, that's a pretty easy answer, right? It's in a vehicle. We all agree on that. Heading out of town. That would be an assumption that would probably fit the area, fit this crime. She is found naked. Some of her clothes are found thrown next to her, but not all of the clothing was found. The manner of death is obviously homicide. At autopsy, it is found that she was strangled, but she was strangled by a ligature. Now, ligature strangulation is not the most common form in ways to kill somebody. It Sure, I mean, it certainly happens a lot, but it's not... Unless it's used by an organized offender, by somebody who brings their own weapons, their own rape kit, or it is a weapon of opportunity. And we'll get into that a little bit further when I deduce what I thought happened here. But let's, let's jump now to why. Why a person dies. Why did Teresa die? To me, there are only two scenarios as to why Teresa died that night. One, obviously, because of an incident that took place at the Academy. I keep saying Academy because I'm thinking of Don Miller. Presidential Arms Apartment Building. Something that occurred there. resulted later, a couple hours later, in her death. Or, the hitchhiking slash walking home. That's it. But both of those scenarios have to be, have to be drawn out and looked into. So, Teresa told the second truck driver, who dropped her off at the police station, that she was sexually assaulted. And I'm going to read what he said. He stated that he dropped her off in front of the police station. If she was sexually assaulted while at the Presidential Arms Apartment building, there is a possibility the offender, offenders or offender wanted to silence her from reporting the crime. So if she told this truck driver that she was sexually assaulted, that could clear up the reason why she was dropped off right in front of the police station. Right? And not her house. So why didn't she go in to report that she was sexually assaulted? Could be a, a, a number of reasons. Could be one, maybe she was embarrassed. Maybe two, she thought she'd get in trouble because she was intoxicated. I mean, she would get in trouble for underage drinking. Three, maybe she had some self-doubt as to whether it was a sexual assault or if it was consensual. But again, we go back to her victimology. Two known sexual partners. I have a hard time believing that all of a sudden she's going to have sex with multiple people at this apartment. I don't care what her intoxication level is. But she's there for four hours and I can't get over that fact. Could she have been held against her will? Sure. Maybe not physically. But again, she she went to this party where she maybe known one person. And now, how's she getting home? You know, it's December. It's cold. But she didn't have a problem walking. 
And her victimology tells you that too. And that's how she left that apartment. Now there's there are several obviously individuals within that apartment that obviously needed looked at. Ronnie, Donnie, David, and Steve. We're going to leave those four. And there might be one or two that I'm missing. But again, I don't have the police reports. So it's very hard to determine with fact. And, and this is important. This is how rumors get spread. So what I try to do is back up each assertion with corroborating evidence. So somebody else saying it. If one person says it, but I can't find anything else to corroborate that, I usually don't use it. But if somebody else says, yeah, I was there, I saw the same thing. Okay, then we'll use that. You have to do that, especially Monday morning quarterbacking these cases. And that's, and that's really what you're doing. It's not fair to the investigating officers to place blame on them when you don't know what they know. And so I don't do that. Now, I will place blame on police officers when they don't contact the victim's families back, uh, are courteous to them, treat them with respect. I mean, that that's what irritates me. But them, you know, you can't go on a platform and blast police officers for an unsolved case when you have no idea what they know, what they did, and you're just going off the broad assumption the case is unsolved and police aren't doing their job. You can't do that. Now these individuals that I that I listed, they, they all, all were interviewed. And in fact, one, at least one of the victim's family members I who I've come to admire greatly uh, her sister Jerry because she doesn't stop she just keeps digging just like a good sister would do for her sister you know that's dead she reaches out to these suspects you know tries to find out the answers you know much respect for her much respect so we have some of those conversations that were passed on to me now everyone suspects that's well I'm not I say everyone but it seems like a fair amount of people including the family of the victim believes that this was related to the presidential armed sexual assault now depending on who you believe at that apartment because there's many different scenarios or, or statements that they gave one that she Teresa went into the bedroom with one of the guys to have consensual sex that guy denies it his name is David now David says you know she wanted she came out and said I take that back I don't know if David said this or one of the other people said that but somebody in that apartment said Teresa that came out and said I'll have sex with all of you guys if you just let me leave now some of the people took that as an invitation and it seems like something took place with not just one person now this David individual stated he didn't have sex with her because he couldn't get it up. Remember that because that's going to play a key role here later on. Regardless of what happened there, because no one, there, there's no clue, no key 
statement for sure as to if she actually had sex with anyone. There was an allegation that she scratched one of the guys. And when confronted later, he said he was having sex with her. She had an orgasm and scratched his face. Now, much like the Greg Emmel case, which he told me he got a scratch because he had a flat tire and it went down over the bank. I knew that was bullshit and it was the victim that scratched him. This is the same bullshit story. That's not why you were scratched. In the face. If you were scratched in the back, in the arm, I would buy it. That ain't how you got a scratch. If you had a scratch. That's the thing. You don't have the police report. If they went and interviewed this guy within three days, they're still going to see that scratch. I'd want to know that. That's key. And if they bought that story, they need to assign somebody else to the case. If that story is true. Again, we don't know. Teresa's body's found. John Bur is it Burlington calls the police. Ronnie shows up at the police station shortly after this, before the body's even recovered, and is making statements allegedly at the police station about her body being found. Now people find this odd. Okay. There are people that surmise that John Burlington was actually Ronnie. And he made the call. John Burlington in the it's not they didn't have 911 then, but in the police call, he said he pulled off to urinate and he saw the body. He went home to call. Remember, they don't have cell phones back then. So he had to drive home to call. Through the years, Ronnie, who was reportedly related to a police officer, had been a suspect. Now remember, he was at the Presidential Arms Apartment, so you know, anybody there to me is a suspect. So him being there certainly would raise him up as a suspect to me. Now... There were some allegations of maybe a police cover-up, not recording his interview. He, he wasn't interviewed, apparently, until years later. Now, why this is, I, I don't know. I don't want to assume. But at some point in time... Ronnie was picked up for a DUI. And he was brought to the station and he offered he wanted to talk to somebody about Teresa Corley murder. Now right off the bat, that strikes me as odd. Kind of interjecting yourself into the case. Why? If you haven't been interviewed... Why are you bringing this up, especially if you're drunk? Does that mean you have something on your chest that you want to get off? According to the police officer's email, which I read, he got he was at home. They called him. He went right in. Yep, tell me what you want to tell me. He said he didn't kill Teresa, but he knew he did. But he didn't want to be known as a rat. And he didn't want to didn't want to say, you know. The detective was trying to coax him to do the right thing. The chief of police came in and said, I want everything audio and video recorded, and at that time Ronnie shut up. Didn't want to talk anymore. 
Now, through the years, that had been construed as police corruption. He didn't record what he was saying, therefore, you know, he was covering up for, for Ronnie. When in actuality, what he was doing was much exactly what we did in the Don Miller case, which ultimately the district attorney said the confession would be suppressed. You let him talk. You let the suspect talk. And then, after they're done with their confession, then you record it. Now, why do you do that, you ask? Well, because, number one, they're talking. You don't want to stop them and give them a second doubt to stop talking. You let them confess. Then you record it. So everything that that detective did, I felt, is 100% right. The guy didn't want to be known as a rat. He stopped talking. He didn't want it to be audio, video, recorded. Why does he say this? Why does Ronnie say this, that he knows who did it? Is it because he truly knows, or was he trying to get out of a, a DUI? I'll give you my opinion at the end of this. Now, let's get back to my key clue. The quaaludes and eggs. Three different siblings remember this. Where did she get the eggs from? Well, that's going to be key. You know, remember she's dropped off at 5 a.m. in front of the police station by the second Gary Lake Farms truck driver. She's not seen again until 5.30. So there's a 30-minute gap. Approximately, we don't know for sure. What was she doing? Where was she at? Until she's seen again at 5.30 by the three guys carpooling to work. Now, right across the street from the police station is a restaurant called Maria's. Maria's opens up at 5 a.m. And it's frequented by a lot of truck drivers. Could she have went in there and ate breakfast? And that would account for the eggs in her stomach. Or did she have eggs at the Presidential Arms apartment? If those eggs are in her stomach, I would want to know that. Huge clue. Huge clue. In my original assessment of the case, I stated that I believe Teresa was murdered by a truck driver. Now, why did I say that? The eggs in her stomach, the 30 minute gap that's missing, the fact that that she was found off a major interstate. When you look at the photograph in the newspaper of them pulling the body up from the gully, you see the end of a guardrail, okay? So this is the guardrail, and then there's like a little pull-off, and that's where she was found. It's the first pull-off that you can find coming out of that town so you're in that town you get up on the interstate you're driving there's guardrails the only place that you can pull off is right there it's the first place and that's where she's found to me if she was murdered by somebody at that presidential arms who said hey you know what we sexually assaulted this girl we raped this girl we cannot let her talk. We Somebody's got to go find her. They find her. 
if you look at an aerial of that area, there's a lot of back roads and there's a lot of woods and there's even a river to dispose of a body for locals would know that area. In my mind, in my thinking, why the hell would you get up on an interstate, a major interstate, at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, when people are starting to come to work, it's starting to get busy, to dump a body. You're out in the open. Makes no sense. But a truck driver who would have been eating at Maria's restaurant, getting up on the interstate and heading out of town and pulls off at the very first pull off that you can to dispose of the body. To me, at that time, what, five years ago, made sense. Made the most sense. In addition to that, the ligature strangulation to me, and the fact that she was found nude, indicated to me at the time that the offender was more than likely a sexual sadist. To have a ligature. Now remember when I said the penthouse sales where she worked and they sold that type thin rope it was a thin line a thin ligature strangulation what can cause that it's not a belt it's not her bra it's not clothing articles it's a thin wire or rope or nylon Strangulation, shoelace, maybe. But if it is not premeditated by an organized defender, why, if it was somebody local, somebody from the presidential arms, what would they, it would have to be a weapon of opportunity. But like what? What's laying around that's thin, that's in your car, that you're going to use to strangle? We know that through victimology, she would get into vehicles, but she was a half a mile from her house. She had already walked a lot. She was there. Why not continue that walk? I don't, I don't have an answer for that. The best I can come up for is maybe if it wasn't a truck driver, it was somebody that she knew and trusted from work that maybe was in that restaurant that would have given her that ride. She would have felt comfortable. It was only another half mile till she got home. And they would have had a thin ligature from that rope or from that place of employment to strangle but I think you could deduce that whoever did this either got out of town or lived out of town it's the only reason to get up on the interstate if you stayed in that town you have rivers you have forests to dispose of a body that is the major reason why at the time five years ago my assessment focused on more than likely a truck driver. And the fact that we had what, 18 other murders of young women from New Bedford all the way to Franklin within this time frame that were murdered, missing, and some were located off of major highways. That's why I gave that assessment. Now, do I still believe in that assessment? I do. Yet... That detective that interviewed Ronnie at the police station said he was ready to confess the things. And you can't believe in coincidences, can you? That a sexual assault took place and then she's found murdered the same day? It's a tough one. 
I felt very confident in this assessment when I worked it for the family. And I still think that's a possibility, and even maybe a probability. But so is somebody from the presidential arms being responsible for this case. Now, let's jump ahead to an update. I believe last year, Teresa's body was exhumed. Now, I'm unsure what I'm confused about, and I should have got clarification from Teresa's sister before I did this video, but I did not. I'm confused on the fact that they did find semen on Teresa's jeans. Now, I'm not sure why they had to exhume the body to find that. Which I doubt she was buried in those jeans. But regardless, they got a match. And the match for the semen on the jeans was to David. Remember David, who went into the bedroom with Teresa, who said, I couldn't get it up. Couldn't get it up. How'd your semen end up on her pants? So he's lying. Is he responsible for the murder? The district attorney's office will tell you that's a big leap. Could have been consensual sex back there that, ha that took place. And they're right. You just don't know. You just don't know. But he lied. Much like Jay lied to me in the Gail Matthews murder. Didn't have didn't have sex with her. Didn't have sex. Can't can't explain how her semen ended up in her in a large quantity. And then when confronted 20 years later, he says to me, "Okay. You got me. I did do it." Well, that doesn't mean he murdered her. Just that he was lying. The same thing with David. Teresa's sister still pushes very hard for this case, as she should. I do not know what the police know. I would want to read the statements from all those guys at Presidential Arms Department and what they observed. I'm dying to know. The truth is in there. It's hard to make the truth through assessments when you don't have everything but you could deduce a lot which I have done and I think it helps it doesn't hurt because what if the police believe it's related to the presidential arms apartment that's very good assumption but then they get my report and they say well, we never considered the eggs in the Quaalude, her eating at this restaurant, which was right across the street from where she was dumped. You know, consider this. You think now most police office or police stations are open 24-7. But some aren't. Some, are, you have to, they're on call. The small, I don't know what about this police station. Maybe it wasn't open at 5 in the morning. And you say, well, that sounds strange. That's not strange. There's some small towns where you have to call a number to get police service. Why didn't she go in there? Maybe it wasn't open and she decided, hey, it doesn't open until 6. I'm going over here to eat some eggs, eat breakfast. The police officers should check that restaurant out. Now, maybe they did. I'm sure they did. And then we just don't know. But no one's talking about the quaaludes either. If she had quaaludes in her system, she wasn't a drug user. She experimented with marijuana, which everybody did back in the 70s. Did she take quaaludes voluntarily? I doubt it. Which means somebody had to give them to her, maybe to date rape her. 
Could she have gotten those at the truck stop? Or the Maria's restaurant? Yeah, but that'd be a lot more difficult. It'd be easier to do it at the Presidential Arms. you got to imagine five, six guys at this apartment drinking, already drunk. She's drunk. One girl. One girl. You think she didn't feel uncomfortable there? And if she did come out and say, I'll have sex with all of you guys if you just let me leave. What's that tell you? She's being held against her will. One way or another. Such a, a difficult case when you don't know everything. When you, when you don't know what happened inside that apartment. There's a couple guys there that, that certainly do. Now I believe Ronnie has since died. Took whatever he knew to the grave. But there's people that do know. They certainly know. They know whether she was raped or not, or whether it was consensual. That's a start. Because there's two different versions. There's some people, you know, that were in that apartment that said, yes, she was raped. And you have other people saying, no, she it was consensual. Who do you believe? Is it possible that it was consensual? Yes. Probable? I don't think so. There was also indications from at least one of the people that were in that apartment that somebody did go looking for her that night after she left. Did they find her? Maybe. I know one of the guys there, his name was Steve. I believe he's the one that had the scratch on his face. I know how you get to his house, though. You get up on 495 and you go out of town because he didn't live in town. Again, I go back to why dump a body off of the interstate? Why? The only reason I can think of is because you're heading out of town. No other reason that I can think of. To me, that would take away a couple of those people at the presidential arms apartment. So then you can deduce, hey, it's somebody that lives out of town. Was there anybody in that apartment that lived out of town in that direction? Northbound 495. If the answer is yes, you better put a big circle around that guy's name and look into him a little bit further. If not... I go back to my original assessment. Look at a truck driver who was eating at Maria's. But 5.30 in the morning, getting daylight, well, it's an odd time for a serial killer to strike. And again, I'm not, serial killers are not the majority, not even close. People have a perception that if it's an unsolved case, they want to point at serial killers. And they'll say, well, Israel Keys was active during that time frame. Then there, Ted Bundy has thought, you know, relatives that live in that location. Well, that doesn't matter. The majority, I'm saying 90%, even probably more than 90% of murders are not done by serial killers. Yes, it's possible, but it's not always probable. However, in this case, when you have 19 other murders of young people in that area, you have to consider it. You have to. So what do I think? I think it's one of the two. You know? I, I always say listen to the family. Listen to the friends. They know the area more than an outsider looking in. They live there. They know the reputations of the people involved. You have to consider that. You take that in. I didn't always believe that. 
I wanted to be as neutrally unbiased as possible and didn't want to hear anything until after I'd done my assessment, which is good. And I felt strong about this assessment five years ago, and I still feel it's it's probable. But it's just as probable as those people with the presidential arms having something to do with this. 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, odd time for a serial killer to strike. But it happens. It's an odd time for anybody to strike. You know... An opportunistic killer seeing her walking down the street. Is she, is she hitchhiking? I don't think. She's already there. She's so close to home. Would she, would she actually hitchhike that extra half a mile? I don't think so. She would just go. But she would get a ride from somebody that she knew. Would somebody she knows from the presidential arms, would she get back into a vehicle with them if they came by? I don't know the answer to that. She could. If she was cold, maybe she wasn't scared, even though she may have been sexually assaulted. I just don't know. That's the damnedest misery of it all, is the million questions that only Teresa and the killer knows. I'm going to end that on that note. It's been a tough week for me to go back through Teresa Corley because it, it, I have it in here for this family, like I do all families, but this one's tough. A lot of questions, a lot of unanswered questions that I certainly would know, like to know the answers to. But, you know, if you have any information, if you're watching this, this channel has grown by leaps and bounds. My one video has well over half a million views. And if you're watching this and you have information, please contact uh, the Massachusetts State Police. And I'm going to give the number. 781-830-4990 and that's to the Norfolk, Norfolk District Attorney's Office tip line call and give your information you know it's been since 1978 this family deserves answers Teresa she deserves justice and that's that's all we can ask for so thoughts and prayers as always always to the victim and the victim's families and let's get some closure to this case it just tears me apart this is it Teresa Corley uh, deep dive remember Thursday tomorrow we're gonna do a live chat about this case so I can hear some more input listen I don't know everything I'll be the first to admit that you know I'm not always right and some people have different theories. And I, I'm willing to listen to that. You know? I think every good detective should be willing to listen. We're going to do that Thursday. Friday, I'm going to answer your questions and comments on the video like I do every Friday. So let's finish this week out strong. Let's get some answers for the Corley family. And uh, let's get some justice for Teresa Corley. With that, Maine's out. Good evening, everyone. Back again. Seeing a lot of new badges over here. Not seeing too many new stuff. I'm seeing a lot of FBI badges or police badges. So it all looks good. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Teresa Corley, the murder in 1978, December 5th or December 8th, whichever. I guess we really can't tell. So let's get started. First and foremost, I want to thank you all for being here, as always. I appreciate all your comments that you leave, um, and I appreciate you supporting the channel. I think we're at 37, 
thousand five hundred subscribers, which pretty much all came from this year. So thank you. I appreciate that. And I appreciate the membership as well. So Teresa Corley, um, another case where the shoes are kind of, uh, play an important role, but not as important, obviously, as Brenda Condon case. Um, it's a mismatched shoe. They know where it came from. And the police know a lot more, obviously, than we know. So some of the questions that I saw already on the uh, videos, I don't have answers to. They're good questions. And I'm sure that the police have the answers to them. At least some of them. So, start us off with a question. Who wants to go first? I see Doc, Cat, Stacy, Donna, Will, Brittany. Brittany, I know that name. You got something coming in the mail. Katie, Angela, I haven't seen you for a while. Oregon Coast, beautiful. Home of Steve Prefontaine. Manager of three. I haven't heard from you in a while either. I'm glad you made it. Okay, Donna. The shoe gave me a red flag. Okay. Tell me about that. Why does the shoe give you a red flag? Other than she was trying to get out of that apartment. And she put on mismatched shoes. It's not like today where... You know, you can kind of tell the difference between a men's shoe and uh, a female shoe. There, they were kind of unisex shoes, but they were definitely mismatched. So tell me why that throws a red flag at you. Where did they find her jeans? Uh, I don't know if they found her jeans. Yes, the jeans were next to her. There were some parts of her clothing, and I don't know the specific parts right now. At some point, I think I did know, but some of her clothing was missing. But her jeans were found beside her, I believe. Will, watching a show with my son. I'll have to come back and watch after. Sorry, guys. I know I'm missing out. Hey. Well, you should be watching this show with your son, Will. I guess it depends on how old he is, but I definitely give him a little shout out. Laura, do we know if there was a rape kit done at autopsy? I don't know that. I would hope so, but I don't know that. Same with the fingernail scrapings. Uh, you know, those are obviously pretty much standard procedure. but And I'm sure they did them, but I just don't know the answer to that. Cat says she was in a hurry. Absolutely, I believe that. Teresa ate the eggs and they were in her stomach at the time of autopsy. Then we can conclude possibly that she had to have been killed within 45 minutes of eating those eggs. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how long it takes. I don't know where the eggs are at. I don't know if the eggs are in the stomach, if the eggs are in the digestive tract, in the small intestines, in the large intestines. So without that knowledge, I don't think we can conclude for sure how long it had been that she ate the eggs. Two different shoes. Did one of the guys at the apartment come to retrieve the shoe and maybe silence her? Uh, the second part of your question, to silence her, I would say yes, but to retrieve his shoe, eh, that's kind of a, a stretch. I don't know if I if I would believe that. I mean, because first of all, where are they? how are they going to know where to find her? You know, after she left. I mean, by happenstance, she's walking down the road and almost home. So, I don't know. I don't know. Is it true a partial profile was found via Teresa's fingerprints? I don't think that's true. I never heard that. But I don't know. I don't understand the two different truckers, if they were cleared or not. I'm sure that they were. Uh, um, they were definitely interviewed by the police, 
and I'm sure they had their time records and everything right there. So, I mean, everything that they said matched up. First one's dropped her off at the front of the entrance. Second one picks her up there and dropped off, and she's seen by three people. So we can assume that they were telling the truth. The average transit time for eggs to digest out of the stomach and into the denunium is 30 to 45 minutes. Okay, I will, I will take your word on that because I don't know. And if that's the case, it goes back to my original assessment, which is that she ate a Maria's. But you would think that somebody, it can't be that busy there in the morning, right? The police would have had to have gone there and talked to people. I mean, you would hope that they did. I don't know if they did. That would be after the exhumation. Okay, yeah, I don't know about that, Katie. But someone could have tricked her into taking the quaaludes, telling her it's Tylenol to help her feel better. Sure, that's possible. The men's shoe on one foot makes me believe that she'd be more likely to accept the ride for the last half mile home. Yeah, maybe. I mean, that's a long way she's already walked. And I like to know the size difference in those shoes, you know. Cheryl Ann, late as usual, made it. I'm glad to see that you're here. Donna, what about the person who stopped at the police station and asked if Corley was found on 495 yet? He knew who she was. She was there. That was Ronnie, from what I understand. And that is one of the reasons he obviously is a main suspect in this murder. I'm frozen. Moon, I'm never frozen. That's why you said never mind. Who do we got here? Make... Make... Avelli, Machiavelli, you're new, so welcome. I am sure she was either given at party or the killer gave her the lose. Do you think that she was killed by the guy at the party to silence or conceal the crime? Yes. It's either that or she hooked up with a trucker that was leaving or somebody that was leaving out of town. That's the only two possibilities that I have. To me, I don't mean this as shaming. I'm just saying me. I would be terrified if I were raped being around men that were strangers. I would be terrified if I were raped being around men that were strangers. Well, I would hope that you would be terrified by anybody that's raping you. Yeah, especially strangers. So I don't think that's weird at all. Uh, if she put on different shoes, they must have been in the same room when she probably got raped. So the shoe belongs most likely to the rapist. Absolutely. If the rapist came to silence her, then maybe he's the one to kill. You're right on there. Uh, and I cover that. You'll Tonight, when I release the uh, q and A, I I said that exact same thing. So we're thinking the same. So I'll release that tonight for you guys. What if your truck driver theory is correct and he saw her in the parking lot of Maria's and had eggs to go? She's cold and the inside of the cab is warm. He offers her a ride home. Sure. I mean, I, I get that. And I think that's what I put in my original assessment is somebody at Maria's locked into her and offered her a ride home. I mean, to me, it's one reason and a very good reason to explain why getting up on the interstate? If it was a local, I felt there's a river right there. There's lots of woods to get rid of her. Why would you? So it's more secluded to get rid of a body. Why get up on an interstate that's busy? Even at 630 in the morning. Maybe it's not quite daylight yet, but it's getting there. And you have traffic going to work. To take that chance to dump her there, to me, meant they were heading out of town, heading north on 495. 
I'm steadfast in that. Um, I could be wrong, of course. But it's the most logical reason for me. For some reason, I've got to keep... Uh, YouTube is blocking stuff here, and it keeps asking me to show it, so i got to keep clicking on it. Maybe he realized his shoe was missing and went out looking for. Yeah, maybe. I don't know about that. I keep thinking about the police officer who gave totally different descriptions of how he found a body. Yes, Mary, but you got to understand... Not this is 40 years later, he's giving those descriptions. He doesn't remember. Okay, I don't think it's anything related to a police cover up or anything. He's just losing his mind with age. That's all that is. B Ham 311, thank you. I don't want your money, but I appreciate it anyhow. I tell everybody that don't send me any money, but I would want you as a member. So remember that. Donna, with you as our leader, teacher, and all of, the, of this team on um, Solve No More, one of these times someone is going to unlock a lead that begs to be investigated and just might lead to something big. Let's hope so, okay? You guys, uh, you know what you're doing. There's no doubt. So keep working on your stuff and you'll make, you'll make shit happen. I say the shoes were an escape effort trying to get away from the guys at the apartment. Yeah, I mean, it was. She was in a hurry. This is what I envisioned. She's in the bedroom. Whatever happens, happens. Now, I think I talk, I do talk on the video that I'm going to release tonight on the Q&A about an email that I received from, there was a guy in the apartment. His name was Larry, I believe. Larry's best friend wife sent me an email. She said Larry confessed to him that Ronnie and Larry held her down while the other three or four raped her. And then she busted out of the apartment in a hurry. They let her go. She didn't break out um, looking for the shoe. And like we had discussed the shoe what I would want to know, and I and I go into this on that question and answer, so I don't want to do it too much, but hey, when I'm interviewing somebody from that apartment, you know what I want to know? First question. We sit down to have an interview. I don't even bring up Teresa's name. First thing I want to know is, hey, uh, what's the cleanliness of that apartment? Well, he's going to say, well, it's fine. It's a normal guy's apartment. Why do you ask that? Well, I'm just curious. Does he vacuum? Does he sweep? Do you, do you guys clean? Well, blah, 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 blah. How about uh, when guests come over? How do they act? Like, do, is there a hook by the door that you put your, your coat on? Yeah, yeah, we have that there. How about like a, uh, a, a placemat when you come in, you know, wipe your feet off of? Yeah, yeah, we have that. Oh, so do people take off their shoes when they come in probably, right? Eh, no, we don't do that. Bingo. So now you know that when people don't take off their shoes when they come into the apartment, they take them off in the bedroom where she was raped. Then you can work backwards and say, hey, whosever shoe that was, more than likely is the one that raped her. Right? Maybe. Maybe I'm crazy. All right. I was very troubled by the chief of police interrupting Ronnie and uh, Barge and demanding the – I'm not in – I'm not too – I've seen that happen before, Doc. So that doesn't bother me too much. Uh, he wanted everything audio and video recorded. Some people are like that. The fact she was dumped naked makes me lean more towards a trucker instead of someone from the party since she was already assaulted by them. Laura, I was in total agreement with you. I pay no attention to truckers on the side of the highway. I assume most people don't as well. Exactly. It provides great cover um, to drag a body down to a side of a gully. 
Dave dumped her body on the way home. See, sure, I am, but you can't say that. You don't know that 100%. So what you have to say is, hey, in my opinion, Dave dumped her body on the way home. YouTube made a silly update today and changed color scheme. Other things are weird, at least on my end. Huh. Everything looks the same here for me, Moon. I don't know. Maybe a man put the shoes like that before dumping. Maybe a man put the shoes like that before dumping. No. It was confirmed it came from the, the house. So she is gang raped. That's what I was that's what I was told. Was any attempt made to conceal the body? Not that I am aware. Jerry on the podcast said that Steve, one alleged rapist, went to Alpine Apartments. Just so happened that Teresa's boyfriend lived there. Told police that he overheard Steve saying where T was that night. Yep. What's going on, Ken? This is Rodney from Brewington, Alabama. What's up, Rodney? Nice to see you, buddy. That would mean I'm crazy, too. No, because I said I was crazy. Well, you know, we're a bunch of old old crazy people in here, I guess. Our police department in my town don't open until around 8, but we can go to the Kentucky State Police. Yep, that was my assumption, is maybe she tried to go to the police and they weren't open. But we don't know. It's all conjecture. What if she was dumped that way to blame her murder on a trucker? Very, uh, very possible. Very possible. Um, especially knowing about all the other serial killers or serial killings that were taking place in New Bedford and I believe, uh, well, on the interstate as well. So, yeah, it's possible. A local probably wouldn't risk being seen and recognized on the highway. Well, that's what I thought as well. You know, a local would know more secluded spots to get rid of a body and not the interstate. That was my thinking. She ate eggs at Maria's, started walking home, and those guys were waiting for her. In your opinion. You always got to throw that in there, Cheryl. Because you don't know. Shoelace, bootlace is a possible murder weapon. Sure. Was she strangled from behind or in front? Was she sexually assaulted by the murderer? I don't know that. I don't know that. Another thing that uh, I thought of is a purse strap. Because we couldn't find her purse that I know of. So I thought maybe if she was carrying a purse, somebody would know that. And a purse strap could be used as well to create that ligature mark. Depends. I, I was told a thin ligature. I, purse straps that I know about are pretty thick. But pretty thin is an arbitrary word. So uh, I don't know. How far away was the highway from the cafe? Joan, I would suggest you pull up Google Maps and look, uh, and you'll see 495. It's not far. May, I'm going to say maybe five miles. Guess on my part. But somebody look that up, and you'll see it. Did they DNA test the shoe? Um, no, not that I, I'm aware. I think they found out who the shoe belonged to. So there would be no need to DNA test the shoe. The shoe was from somebody from the presidential arms department. I was thinking the thin thing to choke her with might be speaker wires as well. Sure, that, that's a good option. What's going on with my camera? I 
Uh, is that better? I think that's better. I'm going to leave it like that. Gina, you're supposed to be sleeping. Isn't it like 3 o'clock over in the country you're at? You can't get up for these. That's ridiculous. Go back to sleep. Although I, I like seeing you here. I'd rather you get good sleep instead. Smaller purses have very thin. I carry a small leather purse that has a very thin strap. Okay, well, see, I might be on to something. You never know. Yes, based on Jerry's persistence, she found out about a lot. David moved to Kentucky. She tried to contact him until a lawyer was hired. David made accusations of harassment. Did they ever find the other matching shoe? I believe they did. I believe they did. It's frustrating to have so many unanswered questions. wonder if any part of this would be available in public records. Well, the police logs... Uh, Gina had sent me. She did some research on that. And uh, um, Teresa's sister sent me a couple emails this week that had some police reports that I hadn't seen. Some redacted statements, the interview that Ronnie gave, um, stuff like that. So you just have to be able to search the Internet. You can find that stuff. You mentioned that her workplace was something significant. I took that regarding the lit ligature. Yeah, it was penthouse sales. And when them, when I researched what they did and they manufactured uh, like ligatures. I don't want to say ligatures. You want to say rope of some sort, but it was like a thin rope. And that bugged me a little bit. And I wrote that in my assessment back in 2016 and gave that to... Uh, Jerry. Other thing about her workplace, I wondered about a co-worker. Yep. But the only thing that bothered me about a co-worker is they're probably going to work at 630 in the morning. And to strike, to be an opportunistic murder, to strike, the only reason I feel that that, because that time of day is is odd. That's It's just an odd time. Now, I know killers strike at any point in time, but for different reasons. If it's a rage killing. But a, a serial killer out trolling at 6.30 in the morning, yes, but kind of, Kind of doesn't make sense to me. A, co a co-worker going to work doesn't make sense to me unless they were enamored by her, her physical state. And by that, I mean opportunistic. She was drowsy. She was cold. She was intoxicated. She looked like an easy target. So... But that would be easy pretty much to find out. Find out what the work hours were at penthouse sales. Find out if anybody called off work that day or if anybody was late going to work. Um, there's a lot of leads, I think. Maria's restaurant, all that to be followed up on. And like I said, the police probably did it. I don't know. I don't know what they did. And I don't want to accuse them without having any facts. So I won't accuse them. I'm going to assume they did all those things. We need the autopsy report. The eggs are the key. If we can find out where the eggs and quaaludes were located in our digestive system, we can determine approximately when she ate the eggs. Right, but Doc, think of it like this. Even if she ate the eggs at Maria's, let's just assume that she did. That doesn't get us any closer to who the killer is. All that does is eliminate, well, she didn't eat the eggs at the presidential arms. She still could have been picked up after she ate the eggs by somebody from the presidential arms apartment building. And she could have been picked up by a trucker. 
and she could have been picked up by a co-worker. So I don't think the eggs, I don't think the eggs will tell us anymore. Now, they were my key clue was the quaaludes and eggs. And the reason that being is because I don't, nobody had placed her at Maria's. At least, you know, when I talked to Jerry, that wasn't even a, a thought. No one even thought of that. So when I brought it up, I thought it was key. More, it was a key to a truck driver. Because of 495, because of the ligature. And that's what I thought. So I thought the eggs were important. However, I'm five years removed from that. And now I can't get away from what happened at the presidential arms. I can't say, man, boy, it's coincidental. She gets gang raped. And then she just happens upon a serial killer and truck driver. I don't know. I was wondering where a semi would have parked, how far they would have to walk to get to his truck, if it was a trucker, and if he did it in the truck or somewhere outside. Well, I'm sure it would have been inside the truck. Seven made it. Glad to see you. It makes sense to me that she ate at Maria's eggs for breakfast. That makes sense to me, too. Maria's is right next to a truck stop. The only thing that matters is between 5 a.m. and 5.30 a.m. Well, that's a pretty good time to start, Gina. Just as blessed is here. Welcome. If the guys at the presidential arms admitted to raping her, wouldn't they say they fed her too? Yeah, I mean, if they were interviewed, they... But if the quaaludes were mixed with eggs at the presidential arms apartment, they're not going to admit to giving her, making her any food. Um, yeah, they just wouldn't admit it. The eggs would give us a time of approximate death. It would, but in the grand scheme of things, does that really matter whether the time of death was 5.30 in the morning or it was 6.30 in the morning or 7 or 8? The same suspects will still apply as far as we know. So the time of death in this instant, I don't think really matters. Victimology. In my opinion, she didn't take the quaaludes herself. She was very intoxicated. Well, and your second part of that, Donna, is why she may have taken them on her own accord. She was very intoxicated. So, yes, victimology tells us she probably wouldn't have. And they were probably given to her as a date rape type of drug. However, we don't know that for sure. When someone's intoxicated, as you know, as everybody knows, sometimes you will you will partake in activities that you would not do when you're sober. So we can't say for sure. Is David still alive? Yes, I believe he is. And I believe that's, like I said, that's, the DNA that came back on the genes was his. Did any of them have any criminal records after this? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Ronnie did for sure, because he at least had a DUI when he was interviewed. But I don't know for sure. Any serial killers that used lewds and eggs? It's off that one would be trolling for a victim at 5 at 6 a.m. I agree. I'm wondering if the ligature was a shoelace. Yep, we, we discussed that, Amanda. That's a good possibility. Did 
Did he ever explain why his semen was on her jeans? Well, that was just a recent development, I believe, after her body was exhumed. And I believe that was two years ago. I do not know what his explanation was. I am sure that it probably was that they had consensual sex. Um, I don't know where that semen was found. That is almost just as important. If it's found on the inside crotch area where it may have, you know, leaked out of the victim or on the outside, let's say it's down by the ankles. Why? On the outside. To me, then, that portrays a whole different type of meaning with the ligature, where it's at, the point that it could have been from masturbation and not from a consensual and certainly not from a sexual assault either. So those are questions we just don't have answers to. The fact that David lied about not getting it up when he was asked if he had sex with Teresa. Yes, that's uh, it's certainly troublesome, especially when there's evidence uh, decades later that he obviously did. Cheryl Ann, I'll see you. Thanks for attending. What is certain is someone knows or saw something in that time frame after her last sighting. That's commuter time in greater Boston area and tend to get up early. Well, at least one people saw, you know, the carpoolers, the three people, they're the ones that saw her last in front of the Dairy Queen. Get to see the last of the live. Hi, all. Hawk, how are you? Thought you were in here already. My bad. Seven, the shoe thing. I can't shake that. I'd be willing to bet she had two different shoes on because she was trying to get away as quickly as possible. Yeah, you're right. Don't think it was because she was mad. No, that wouldn't make sense. She's in a dark room in the bedroom. She gets up to leave. She's intoxicated. There's no lights on. And she grabs one shoe and grabs the offender's other shoe. And make no mistake, I'm sure it was an offender shoe because the other person who she was having sex with had to take off their shoes too. I guess they didn't have to, right? Um, girls really don't have to take off their shoes either. But uh, in this instance, it seems like that was what happened. Steve showed sadistic tendencies as follows. No empathy, remorse, impulsive control, inflicts pain, aggression, recurrent cruel behavior, emotional cruelty. He showed this often in case. I, I don't know much that much about Steve to, to say that. And I think you're, you're getting that from Ann Burgess, and I know Ann Burgess. Uh, and she does, you know, great work. She always has. In fact, and I'm reading one of her books for probably the third time now that I just got uh, pulled back out. So, but I don't know that much about Steve to say that. So you can say that in your opinion. I just, I can't. What about a sexual sadist angle? Well, certainly, certainly with the ligature. And certainly about 495, that would make you think that. But that's all that you could can go off of. Moon, I hear you. Gotta say on those cool cases. That's right, Hawk. Marty, nice to see you that you made it. I appreciate it. The ligature would be sadistic. Well, it could be. But you can't make that assumption either. The ligature could be a weapon of opportunity. Picture this example. Picture Teresa is walking down the road. One of the guys from the presidential arms pulls up. 
let's say he has no intent on murdering her, but his intent is, hey, we didn't rape you. You consented to that. Remember? You're high on quaaludes, blah, blah, blah. And she, and known to her victimology, she's a fighter. What if she slaps him? What if she slaps him and says, I'm going to the police. That's it. Now he freaks. He's looking for something. What 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 do I kill her? You know, what do I hit her with? And the only thing that is there is, hey, there's a shoelace. Wrap that around and choke her. That doesn't mean it's sadistic. That's a weapon of opportunity. So you can't make that jump. Does, does that make sense to you? Katie, he told Jerry that Teresa shouldn't have gotten drunk or she shouldn't be alive. That's cruel. Yeah, it's cruel, but it's also stupid. It's stupidity on his part. So it doesn't make him uh, a sadist, in my opinion. Do we know how Teresa was dressed when the three men were carpooling at 530? I didn't see anything about that. I never heard anything about that. But the truck drivers should know. And I'm sure the police had to have asked. That's a very basic question that you ask. Well, what was she wearing? You say she was cold. What was she wearing? Did she have a coat? Did she have a purse? What all did she say? You know, that was would be what I wanted to know. When you when you picked her up, what did she say? We know that she said she was sexually assaulted to one of the drivers. But what else? What of the mundane details did she say? Did she say, I'm hungry? That would give you a clue that she went to Maria's. Um, did she say, I just want to go home and take a shower? And I'm sure the police have all that information. They they had to have asked the truck drivers that stuff. All right, let me move my way back up here. Truck driver seems like an ideal serial killer job. Oh, it is. She was running. That's so incredibly sad to be intoxicated, probably in the dark, being so desperate to get away. It's kind of triggering for me. I'm wondering what else the autopsy could tell us that we don't know. Well, Gina, to me, it would not, it'd be nice to know defensive wounds, the bruising. Um, was she punched? You know, was she beat up before she was killed? Things like that would be important to know from the autopsy. And obviously, whether she was raped, you know, a rape kit should have been done. And I'm sure it was. Kitty, nice to see you. You must be new. I don't recognize your name. I'm late to the live, but was thinking about David. Since he couldn't get it up before, maybe he saw her walking and decided to try again, leading to the assault and murder. Yeah, I could, I could buy into that maybe. Good job, Kitty. Thin jacket. Is that what sh she was wearing, Hawk? How do we know that? See you, Moon. Thanks for attending again. Why are the police still withholding reports and autopsy report? Because that's what police do. They don't share the information uh, with the public. Ligature in a truck cab makes sense to me because it's a quick way to get someone quiet. And if you're strong, you can have the other hand over the mouth. There's probably a lot of information they are holding on to so the perpetrator doesn't know. Absolutely. They absolutely Paula. From Rhode Island, I'm guessing. You look familiar, but uh, you're a new member, so thank you. Teresa. Hi, everyone. Joining in late isn't an autopsy report public information. No. Not that I'm, not that I'm aware of. Katie's up there. Let me, I forgot I missed hers. 
But where was she for two days? Found naked and strangled with ligature. That may not be a full-blown sex sadist, but shows tendencies or he would have dumped elsewhere. Where was she for two days? She just wasn't found. Um, presumably. But, yeah, it's possible that she was the, – the gap is December 5th at 5.30 in the morning – until she was found December 8th. She could have been alive that whole time. I don't think uh, I don't think they were able to determine that. I don't think they gave a time of death or even a day of death. But most assume it was December 5th at 5.30 in the morning because she was that close to being home. Could have she been held captive for two days? She could have been. I guess that's possible. Clothing was given in newspaper articles. Okay. Well, what was she wearing? Uh, thin jacket. I understand that. Jeans. Mismatched shoes. I guess that's it. That's all we know. Why was she found naked with her clothes near her? Well, I'm assuming, I'm guessing that she was sexually assaulted. Again. You know, what other reasoning would that be? Goldie thinks it's the upset boyfriend, huh? Rick. I think Rick had an alibi, but I'm not sure. David probably couldn't get it up if there were like five guys in the room. So, yeah, I could see him getting discouraged and going back to rape her by himself. That's a good possibility. Very good possibility. But again, I, I would focus in on the guy that had a scratch on his face. And I go into that more on tomorrow's video, which you guys will see tonight. Um, if he lived north of there on 495 and he had a scratch on his face and he was from the presidential arms, big circle around that guy. That's who I'd be looking at. They said his DNA was on her jeans, but were they on the outside or the crotch area? That's what I was talking about earlier, Hawk. I would want to know that, too. She could have been held for two days, which would explain the eggs and the quaaludes. Certainly could. Certainly could. Jerry said that's the reason they know about quaaludes and eggs because mother had the report affixed to the fridge. Yep, that's what I understand. I heard that. I'd like to know where it is now. Maybe the garlic driver dropped her at the police station. I would say yes to it being open all night. It's not that small of a town. Yeah. I don't know, guys. I just don't know about this one. All right, we got 15 minutes le left. Let's uh, open it up to any and all questions. So throw them at me. I got a good case for next week. That's all I'm telling you. Was any get info given out on her estimated time of death? I don't think so. There, Hawk wants to know. Jumping on it already. What's next week's case? So next week's case is the Girl Scout murders. I'm here to tell you right now, of all the cases that we've done, I was the most invested, did the most research, and was drawn in the most by that case. Um, heartbreaking is not even the word. The depth of that case, the criminal profiling, the evidence, the suspect, the magnitude, and of course, the three little victims, by far, by far the most invested I became in a case 
since I started doing this channel. I'm not talking about cases that I had when I was on the job. So get ready. It's a, I, when I say a lot of research for a video, I'm talking so far a week and a half, six hour days of research. So get ready for that next week. <sighs> Never heard of Girl Scout murders. Donna, well, you're going to. There was a Girl Scout video uploaded. When I clicked it, it was set to private. <laughs> I know because I messed up. So what happened was I started to record a deep dive on it. And it was so long. It was over two hours. And so when I went to save it from my phone, there was not enough storage. And I had to delete all my apps. I had to delete all my pictures, all videos, everything from the phone, just so I wouldn't be able to lose that. So then when I reinstalled YouTube, the default settings weren't there. And when it uploaded, it went right to public instead of private, which it normally goes to. So in five minutes, I'm getting comments on the video, and I'm like, oh, my God, that's supposed to be set to private. I'm not ready for it. You guys didn't see the key clue yet? You didn't see the unsolved or solved? So I had to get in there quick and change it. So I'm sorry I ruined that for you. Oh. I know that case, but didn't they solve it, or was it a similar case? Well, you'll have to see unsolved or unsolved. What decade will the Steelers win their next Super Bowl? It certainly isn't any time soon, Goldie. Pittsburgh is – they are going to realize what they had in Ben Roethlisberger. They took him for granted for the past 18 years. And when he's gone, they're going to regret it. But he has to go. He's old. Time to retire, Ben. Uh, Laura, it's a P.O. box. Yeah, I didn't see anything from Laura, but yes, that's my address. Any funny USMC ball stories? I only went to one USMC ball. Uh, and, of course, I don't remember it. You can probably imagine why. I had one picture of me there, and I don't even know where that is anymore. I can tell the next one will be an emotional roller coaster. Uh, yes. Yes, it is. Get yourself a USB drive. I did. And so I got this little dandy thing that plugs right into my phone. 512 gigabytes. Doesn't work. Junk. Ah, uh, Gina, I missed yours. Let me go up, back up and see. Timeline change. I went to get the description of what she was last wearing and noticed instead that the newspaper reported she had been last seen leaving the train stop at 12, 1230. Yeah, that's not, that's not accurate. Born and raised in Philly. Go Eagles. Uh, Donna, you were one of my favorite until you mentioned that. At least it's not the Cowboys. What's my plans for Christmas? I don't really have any plans, Stacy. Same old Christmas routine. Get up, wait for my daughter to open the presents and put a big smile on my face. And that's all. That's all I care about. Paula from Rhode Island, you're awesome. Well, thank you. You're awesome. I appreciate that. Doc is yawning about sports. That's great. Get one that has loads of space. Well, I thought 500 gigabytes was a lot of space. Apparently, apparently not. Um, what's next week's date? Are we... Uh, 
next week Christmas yet? Yeah. So the 23rd would be our next live. I think I'll be able to do that. Yeah, I'll do that. But in the meantime, we'll do some giveaways here. Yes, I I saw the tornado through Kentucky. It's horrible. Have you watched Mine Hunters? It's based on Douglas and Wrestler. Yep, I've watched it. I thought it was a very good uh, series. Very good. And again, I didn't when I, when I knew Ann Burgess when I met her. She was a part of my organization. Uh, we went. We met at. Well, I can't even remember where North Carolina. I think her and her husband, and I talked to her obviously about uh, her involvement, what she could do for for me and the organization, the experience and everything that she brings. And at the time, they were working on like a crime scene interactive crime scene on a computer where you could go in and when you clicked on a certain button, it'd bring up the real life picture of the crime scene. It was pretty neat. And they were trying to get me uh, involved in that, I think a little bit, but I didn't know that the show was about her Why I was watching it. I found out later. So it's crazy. Yes, Stacy, anybody in Australia? I, I just checked the other day to see if, uh, Australia was open back up and it's not, I can't send anything to Australia. So I know you're out Stacy. Did you hear that Stevie branch's father was killed in a car accident a few months ago? I don't think I knew that. Yeah, like I said last week, uh, go to the, if you guys have Instagram, go to that, like that, follow it. I don't know even what the hell you do there, but whatever you do, do it. If you, there's also a group on Facebook, Run Solve No More, you can go to that. Um, I have a page on Facebook. I don't post a lot of things, but I post enough. So you can be on that. Also, Twitter, you know, if you're into that social media stuff, in order to keep, you know, know what's going on, go and check that stuff out. The Instagram handle is hashtag unsolved no more. All right, let me think of a good question here. Ah. Uh. I have to look around. It gives me inspiration for a question. Nobody noticed either that I changed some stuff around behind me. I figured somebody would notice that. No one did. Different picture of Elvis over there. Different picture of me in the middle. Got in cool blood over there that nobody noticed. Guess you guys are more focused on this ugliness than that ugliness, I guess. Uh, Donna, Elvis Peck, did you notice that? So maybe somebody did notice. Okay. Uh, I still haven't thought of a question yet. It has to do with, have to do with rock and roll. All right, if, if somebody, this is going to be an easy one, but I know somebody's going to guess wrong. What is my favorite rock band? I hear all those keyboards typing. <laughs> Donna, you got it. You got it first. Yes, the Doors I do like, and they used to be my favorite, but I have converted 
to Leonard Skinner. Now, Donna spelled it completely wrong, but I'm still going to give her credit for it. Brittany, you're close with Guns N' Roses. They're in the, my top five. Zeppelin, I feel, is the best band of all time, but they're not my favorite. It's Leonard Skinner. So, Donna, uh, I'm going to give you a choice. So, hold on. You tell me, Donna, which book you want, and I will sign it and send it to you. So you have the choice of The Murders of Gail and Tamara, The Cold Case Journal, or Unsolved No More. Whichever one you want, I'll sign and send it to you. And I'll wait for your answer, but you have to send me your address. So you're going to have to get on my website and send it to me. Donna, unsolved no more. Okay. Let me think of another one so I'll give away the other book. Hmm. Who is my favorite country music singer? I know I've said this on videos, so. Donna, you got it again, but you can't be the winner. So Andrea, she got it. So Andrea, if you do not already have this book, I will send that to you. So make sure that you get on my webpage and send me your address. Okay. All right. I've got to go. It was a fun chat. I appreciate it. Please leave this chat and remember Teresa Corley. It's the most important part of all of this that we do. And it's not just me. We all do it together. All right. It's very important for you guys to know. I couldn't do any of this without you. You guys feed me. You keep me positive. And you, you just you make things happen. So I appreciate your support, as always. But always remember the victims. And remember Teresa tonight. Now, next week is going to be very trying. The deep dive alone is over two hours, I think. A lot of research into this. So prepare yourself. Do some reading. Check up the Girl Scout murders. And uh, be prepared. It's going to be an emotional week. Okay? I'm not going to tell you guys Merry Christmas because I'm going to see you next Thursday. All right? So watch the videos. Go to Instagram. Go to Twitter. Get more subscribers for this channel, I guess, because the more subscribers we have, there's strength in numbers. Right? So Moon put it out that everybody should be hashtagging Ken's crew. And I like it. So on behalf of Ken's crew, Maine's out. Okay. Today, Friday, Friday for the week of Teresa Corley, which means I'm going to do a question and answer session. I'm going to look at my videos that I posted on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday and go to your questions and comments. Let's see what we can come up with. All right. RetroFan51. Does the family have access to the autopsy since it's still an open case? Uh, no, they don't have access to it. Um, it's something that they certainly would want access to to confirm the Quaaludes and Eggs um, story, if you will. But they don't have it, and I don't see anybody giving it up anytime soon. The Mall Y, 128. I like the breakdown of each case per week, but gosh, it's hard to wait for the next episode sometimes. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry about that, you know, but uh, 
it's a format that seems to work and everybody seems to like it. And I think it will be tweaked here and there as we go forward. Um, you know, when I start going out on scene, maybe we'll have a day that I'm on scene, so on and so forth. So just bear with us as we continue to do what we do. Possibly one or two of the guys from the apartment building went looking for her. I concur with that possibility. They would have had enough time to start to worry whether she was going to talk or not. Finding her close to the police station may have made them try to convince her that they just wanted to see she got home. They were sorry, yada yada. Yes, I think it's possible, even likely, that they would have sexually assaulted her again. It already showed that they had no regard for her as a human being. Everything you state there, Raven, is probably true and correct. It's what I believe um, could have happened. So, certainly. The only problem I have with that, and I stated this before, is would she get in the vehicle again after being sexually assaulted? I don't know. Now, I just got an email and last night that stated there was a couple. One was a transcribed phone call that the sister Jerry had with Steve, who was one of the people at the Presidential Arms. Um, he stated that the gentleman Dave did sexually assault Teresa and he was the one that went looking for her. Now if you remember, Steve is the one who allegedly had a scratch on his face and also that lived out of town from what I understand north of where the body dump location is. And remember, I thought that th that was a very important part of this assessment, is that body dump location being on 495. And I felt that at the time of day, six o'clock in the morning, turning daylight, people coming to work, you pull off at the first spot that you can where the guardrail breaks and allows you to pull off of the main interstate and a truck driver, a truck, a semi truck would block most of anything that's happening that you could take a body and drag it down to where it was and then head out of town. I always felt and I still feel there has to be a reason to get up on that 495, a major interstate where if you're in town and you're familiar with that area, you have a river there. You have a lot of woods. Why get up on the interstate? Unless you have to and you're heading out of town. That's the part that leads me to believe a truck driver from Maria's. Not saying that happened. Because obviously the incident at the Presidential Arms has precedent. What kind of luck does a girl have to be sexually assaulted, to hitchhike all the way home, cold, rainy, and then get picked up by a serial killer? Those odds are astronomical. Common sense will tell you that it was somebody from the presidential arms. But thinking outside the box and looking at the evidence, the ligature, the body dump location, Maria's, eggs and quaalude, that all steers you, steers me, towards maybe, you can't classify it as a serial killer. You don't know if they killed before. If they use a ligature and their sexual status, you would think, but maybe not. Maybe an opportunistic type of murder took place unrelated to the presidential arms 
involving a trucker or somebody getting up on the interstate. I think the odds are against that, but it's it's a possibility. And you have to keep that lane open for interpretation. Enough preaching. Gene C, these old cases are very interesting to look at. It takes you back to the old school ways of investigating a case prior to our modern day digital forensics. Having lived as a young person in the 70s and 80s, it brings you back in time to visualize the way things used to be. For example, hitchhiking was very common during that time when she was murdered. Can't wait for the deep dive. Yes, Gene, you're absolutely right. And I think that's important to remember. Uh, there was a couple comments, you know, were there cameras at the restaurant? Come on. You know, it was 1978. So, you're right. And hitchhiking. Hitchhiking was the favorite, uh, favorite pastime for the hunters called serial killers back in the 70s, without a doubt. It's almost like a drive through at McDonald's for serial killers. Pull alongside, give them a ride. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, sad. Did I just say that? Lemon peasy. <sighs> Folks, it's early in the morning here. It's very early. I'm sorry. Dinner is the key to the resolution of this case. This is from Will. It may be the key to the resolution of many others, too. I know how very rare serial, serial murder is and the chances of two unrelated crazy events that night, but the method of killing, I just can't shake that off. Well, that's where I'm at. This wasn't a juvenile-type, unorganized crime scene in my mind. Well, I'll stop you there, Will, in saying we don't have a crime scene. We have a body dump location possible but not probable that that's the crime scene this was a very calm cool sick individual the drugs i believe may be dosed to her at the party especially her needing to go lay down in a bedroom at a place she's uncomfortable laying down makes you defenseless in a way you wouldn't want to do this if you were uncomfortable if you were drugged and slipping unconscious then you would yeah you know i would concur with the second half of your your comment there being very drunk possibly being drugged yes i think maybe she probably did go in that bedroom to lay down but again she's uncom uncomfortable there she had to have been so but when she left in a panic and has two mismatching shoes. That's somebody that's not taking their time to leave. Think about, put yourself in a situation where you're at a party, it's time to go, you wanna leave, you go to the door where your shoes are, and that's assuming that you took your shoes off at the door. Her shoes could have been taken off, and, th and this is why Minuscule things are important. If I would interview interviewed the people at the presidential arms department, I would have asked very first question. Well, when you got there, what did you do? Well, we walked into the kitchen and got a beer. Wait, wait. Before that, um, nothing that I know of. Why did you take off your shoes? No. Was that a common thing? They don't know why you're asking that question, but you know as an investigator, and so you want to get that out front before. They start putting two two together. And if they say no, and the homeowner and people that have been to that apartment said, no, we never took off her shoes. That's not wasn't a prerequisite of coming into the house. Then you know she took off her shoes in the bedroom. And the only reason you take your shoes off in the bedroom is to go to sleep or to have some sort of sexual intercourse for the jeans to come off. So I would want to know that. Um, but again, going back to... If you're at a party and you're putting your jean, your shoes on, I can imagine they're not by the door. They don't seem like the type of people to me that would be worried about taking off their shoes before coming into an apartment. 
which leads me to believe that her shoes were in a bedroom. It's dark. You're not turning on the light for whatever reason and the shoes are mismatched. It has to be the level of intoxication, the lack of light, and the sense of urgency to get out of the room. I believe that those are the three indicators of, as to why she has mismatching shoes on. But that leads to something else, right? That leads to if they did not take their shoes off at the door and it was in the bedroom, how many different shoes were taken off in that bedroom? At least two, at least Teresa's and somebody else's, right? Just was thinking of something else there. It always happens. Martha Robinson. Ken is so damn consistent with videos. I love it. I think this was a quick kill. No captivity. Just a gut feeling. Drunk with a bunch of guys. No way that spells possible trouble. Well, Marla, I am consistent with videos because that's what you guys deserve. I treat this as my job. So you expect a video every day, Monday through Friday, and that's what I give you. Uh, especially my members you know you are loyal to me in turn I'm going to be loyal to you and do the best job and deliver the best content that I can Cracker Dan sorry to disrespect your guts but I think we need a bit more than that to go on see Cracker Dan this is the problem that I have although you're you're probably right you need more to go on but just because somebody comments that that's their gut you don't have to be disrespectful towards the person in your comments and that's what you did I mean that was condescending now it's very hard to read into language written language as to mood and character and the way it's to be perceived versus the way it's written. But that's the way that I write it. Um, now Marla went on to say, I'm not saying I am a sleuth. It was just my opinion. And then Cracker Dan comes back and says, sorry. Fair enough. I'm going to let it go. Saga. Sometimes bodies are dumped nude along public roads as a statement of disrespect to shame or punish the victim even after death. Think Alexis Sharkey. In this case, I would wonder about the boyfriend who might have been angry that Mrs. Corley left him to proceed on her own to the party where she either had consensual or forced sexual activity with one or several men of, other than himself. Maybe he caught up with her that morning. Strangulation is personal. Did the boyfriend or party assailants know the police officer who was first on the scene of the body discovery site? Did either... Of the truck drivers. Okay, let me try to break down Saga. Sometimes bodies are dumped nude along public highways as a statement of disrespect. Um, I guess that's true. To shame or punish the victim even after death. Uh, yes and no. A lot of times, and most of the times, they're dumped along the road, down in a gully, off the side of the road, is to get rid of the body as quick as possible. Now, if the body was posed, then that's different. That's a sign of shame, punishment, disrespect. Yeah, I'll get that. But just because they're thrown along the road, that's a matter of convenience and not a statement of disrespect. I wonder if the boyfriend was angry at Mrs. Cor Miss Corley and proceeded on her own to the party. Um... Yeah, he was probably upset, but he was talking to another girl, from what I understand. Uh, maybe he caught up with her that morning. Sure, it's possible. Strangulation is personal. Uh, yeah, but it's also a weapon of opportunity. This wasn't strangulation with hands. This was ligature, and that's important to remember. Um, that's either, to me, 
a weapon of opportunity, or planned. Did the boyfriend or party assailants know the police officer who was first on the scene? I don't think so. Did either of the truck drivers? I don't think so. Okay. Ken, here's some info. This is from Katie Hess. That goes to some of the key points you made. One, listen to a recent podcast where Teresa's sister was the guest. She said that her mother had attached the autopsy report to the front of the fridge and that they, the mother, sister, and brother, would often look at it. She was adamant during the podcast that the report said eggs and quaaludes. I know. Like I said, Teresa's sister hired me as a, to look into this case five years ago. So I was aware of the quaaludes and eggs story, and that's why I brought it up. Donna, I have a big question. It was stated that when Teresa was found, she had two different shoes. I talked about that extensively. Did the other one come from the apartments? Yes, I said that. Was that looked into? All the boys at the apartments, did anybody have a match? Yes. I think she had eggs that morning at Maria's restaurant. Oh, that was my assumption as well. Christy, you said yesterday that it was a thin ligature that was her cause of death. Wouldn't that more than likely be a garrote? If so, that makes it seem like an experienced killer did it. Well, it could be a garrote. It could be a shoelace. You know, anything, any thin ligature uh, could be used. You know, so it doesn't have to be a garrote, no. Katie Hess again. Teresa's sister said that Steve, one of the alleged at the presidential arms party, went to the garden apartments where Teresa's boyfriend happened to live. The sister knows this because Teresa's boyfriend heard Steve talking to someone. She thinks he went there to see if Teresa had possibly gone to her boyfriend's. So it does seem like they were already looking for her. I think based on my research, they caught up with her in the short window after she left the restaurant. Very possible if not probable. It's heartbreaking to know she was so close to home. That could have been me, not the exact details. Young, dumb and trusting. Yeah, I think we all were when we were when we were young. Peg, I think it's more important where the quaaludes in her system came from. Was it fully digested? Don't know because we don't have the autopsy report. Was there any tablet remnants left in her stomach, or was it powder put in her eggs? We don't know that. It takes two to four hours to digest the food that gives you the approximately two hour window if the food wasn't digested. She didn't do drugs, so it is suspicious to find them anywhere in her system. Another question is how many quaaludes were in her stomach and in her system? Sorry, Mr. Mains, these are just rambling questions in my head. You don't have to apologize. Um, I understand your questions and we just don't have those answers. I'm sure the police have those answers and they are not releasing that information. Mail from Gina. I'm watching this for the second time. This is just a great channel. I'm so happy and proud to be a part of the community. Thanks everyone and of course, the man, Detective Maine, salute. Well, Gina, mm, I salute you back. Thank you for the compliment. Thank you for being a part of everything. I, I appreciate it. Michael Mysterious. I am captivated by Detective Maines' vibes and professionalism. Thank you, Michael Mysterious. Uh, I don't know about the vibes, but I try to be professional. Uh, I think that's lacking in a lot of YouTube type of true crime stuff. So, hey, that's the only way I know to be. Uh, that's the way I've been my whole career is you, you got to be professional, especially in the career of being a detective or a police officer. That's what the public expects from you. And it just goes back to being a decent human being. Treat others as you'd want to be treated yourself. I mean, the golden rule. It's the golden for a reason. So, but thank you. 
On the night of morning of Teresa's disappearance, it would have been very cold, December 5th, 1978, a low of 27 degrees in Boston, so easily in the low 20s or colder outside of the city and still dark at 5 a.m. Sunrise was at 7.05. She was approximately half a mile from her house, close enough to walk but also close enough to home that she may have felt safe getting a ride from a stranger for a short distance. Oh, that is true, Buzzy. I got gotcha. you. Christina W. Wow, I feel like I should make a flow chart of possible suspects. Counting the hours for the deep dive, Ken. Well, Christina, there's a lot of suspects, but not as many as I've had in other cases. You have probably four or five from the presidential arms, and then, then it opens up. Because if it isn't them, then you're looking for, in my opinion, probably a sexual sadist that's using a ligature, it's probably a truck driver, pro probably was in the vicinity of Maria's restaurant at 5.30 in the morning. One or the other. So, yeah. Like I said, if, if I was the investigator, and this is important, if you take anything away from what I say here today, it's this. Presidential arms, five suspects. Let's just say four or five, I'm not sure. Let's go with five. Where do they live? Where would they go after a night of partying at 6.30 in the morning? If your answer, any one of them, is north on 495, you're circling that guy, and he's the first guy I'm talking to. Okay? That body dump location, to me, is your only clue right now that we can go on. Because we, we can't go off of the quaaludes and eggs. Not 100%. I'm 99%. I'm 100% sure the family believes they saw that. And I'm 99% sure they probably did. But until I had that autopsy report in my hand and I seen it, I'm not going to be believe the eggs and quaalude 100%. I believe it 99, but not 100. So until then, this one suspect, if one of them lives north on 495, he's who I'm talking to. And I believe one of them do. And I think it may have been the Steve who had the scratch on his face. So, I mean, it could be that simple. It doesn't have to be all convoluted into a serial killer and a sexual sadist. It doesn't have to be that. Follow the evidence. If Steve lives north of 495 as Steve had a scratch on his face put it together follow it up these cases just get sadder and sadder I can't help but wonder if the boys who were with her at the party beforehand went looking to keep her quiet uh, but that would be the reason to me that would be the reason B.M. Adina, do we know what was the reason the boys went after the girl? I would be interested to know if they explained that. Because if they didn't do anything suspicious, they must have had some normal explanation. I don't believe they ever said to police that they went looking for her. And the reason they would go looking for her is because, hey, we just raped this girl. We can't allow her to ruin our lives, so we need to go find her. And then they silenced the problem. That's why they would go looking for her. Nate D. I wonder if the investigators canvassed the Dairy Queen and restaurant and at least asked the employees if she was seen or came in for service. Seems like a good place to start, even if the egg story is false. Edit. Okay, so you kind of covered. But my point still stands that she was dropped off there. That's where you would start asking questions. Agreed. Another possibility of the eggs. This is from Robert McFall. One of the truck drivers on their way to work stopped and got a to-go meal and gave her some, but the timeline suggests that she probably did go to the restaurant or even the bar. We all know how hungry you get after a night of drinking. True, but I doubt she's eating eggs at the bar. But that would be easy to determine. And it would be easy to determine if the truck driver gave her eggs. You would 
asked the truck driver because they were interviewed. That's how we got this information that Teresa was picked up by two different Gaelic farm truck drivers. It's because they were interviewed. So you would ask them. Did they ask them that? I don't know. I think the answer lies with the guys that assaulted her. She had a very bad night, <laughs> I would say. As a woman, she would just want to go home to bed, take a shower, sleep. I agree with that. Ken, do you know who discovered her body? I watched this news piece and the info about the man who discovered her, her body and the info about the now deceased man who asked about whether she had been found. Interesting. Yes, okay, so this is a key aspect of it as well. A guy named John Burlington called police and said, I saw a body and described where it was off of 495. He didn't want to give any more information. He said he stopped to relieve himself, which I believe could be credible because, again, the guardrail on 495 and where Teresa's body was found is the first pull-off when you come from out of town or from um, Birmingham. When you get up on 495, you have guardrails there, and then the first place you can turn off where the guardrails are no longer, you would use that to urinate. Whether he did or not, I don't know. But he certainly couldn't call from the scene. No cell phones, so he had to drive home. Again, one of the suspects, I believe, lived in Burlington. So it seemed like a made-up name. People alleged that the person who made that call was Ronnie. The dispatcher who took the call says he knows Ronnie, and he knows his voice, and that was him. And then Ronnie shows up at the police station where... I guess his relative, maybe his father, worked and said, hey, you know, what's going on with his body that you found? But yet it didn't go out to anybody. I can't confirm that. Now, when I did my assessment and my report in 2016 and gave it to the Corley family, I did a section in there about that where it was more detailed. And uh, I just don't recall exactly the details of what I found out and put in that report but yeah it's certainly you know a lot of times people will do that i'll give you an example in my gail matthews murder the boyfriend of gail matthews never called her place of employment ever before he had only been her boyfriend for you know i don't know six seven months if that but it never called her place of employment the day that she died and before her body's found he called three times. Now, in my training and my experience, I'm going to say the reason for that is because there's remorse. And one, he wants her to be found. And then when he is questioned, he's going to say, well, I didn't do it. I was calling her. I was calling her at work. Essentially giving himself an alibi. So that could very well translate to this. But then why use an anonymous name? I believe they looked up and they couldn't find anybody named John Burlington from around that area and could not contact him anymore. So. How long can you tell exactly what a person ate after digestion started? Because the fact that eggs were found in the digestive system is pretty specific information if it's true. I don't have an answer for that. I'm not a forensic pathologist. I'm not a doctor. Um, so, again, when I don't know something, I don't, I don't try to speculate. I stay in my lane. MF, what is the proof that the second driver left her at the police station and didn't go to the restaurant? Well, I don't know whether that's true or not. I know that the second driver was interviewed. That's all I know, and apparently what he said. Being left on the highway a lot of times is a trucker, but she didn't need a ride anymore. Could a neighbor have offered her eggs and drugged her, then dumped her body before daylight? I guess that's possible. 
I would question the police officer that was first on the scene. Also, the guy who called it in and gave a fake name. Sounds like a young man. Well, I believe that they have, you know, police officer first on scene. He was spoke to many times after the years, but I think his memory, he's older and his memory has faded because his story contradicts. Now, just because his story contradicts, don't jump on that and say, well, he's the guy that did it. Come on. I am betting that poor girl ran from what happened at the party and a guy or guys tracked her down in fear of making a police report. Mike Half Moon's mom. I think you're probably 100% um, right. Like I said, it's one or the other. So, how far was her workplace? This is from Aunt Penny. I know a lot of people will stop for breakfast or coffee if they work an early shift. Maybe she saw someone from her job, felt comfortable. It would tie in with the ligature marks. And that is, yes, you're right. Um, it could be completely coincidental that she was killed with a ligature and she worked at a manufacturing plant that made that type of um, ligature. But again, it's something that has to be looked into, right? You have to be able to look into that and, you know, it's it's possible what you're the scenario that you're presenting it's possible and what if what if then it strikes as a crime of opportunity she's drunk she's woozy and they decide to take advantage of that again man the astronomical statistical realm of her being raped basically gang raped by four or five guys being drugged with quaaludes and then meeting her demise five minutes from being home by a completely different person or set of persons what's the odds of that I don't know I, again if I don't know I don't know I can only offer my insight. I'm not a psychic. But I could probably give you just about as good information as a psychic can. <laughs> because they don't know any more than I do. My opinion. Love the shirt. Waylon. Great taste in music. Thank you for saying that. Waylon Jennings, my all-time favorite country music uh, artist. And now I just started listening to his grandson, Way Jennings, who sounds just like him. Ann Reedy, getting bright at 5.30 in the morning, middle of winter. Sure, the guys carpooling to work thought they saw her, but they could have been anyone, including her. Did she have money with her? If not, who took her to the restaurant, fed and drugged her, and managed to take her away without being seen? If the restaurant staff not talking? I don't know. Don't have answers to any of that other than she was seen by three guys that were carpooling that put her in front of the Dairy Queen which was almost to her house could they have been mistaken and seen somebody else I guess but it seems like it was around her way of travel so I would have to know what exactly they saw did she have money with her I don't know I don't know if she had a purse with her but Hey, I'm seeing, am I seeing a little bit of sunbeams coming through here? Again, on this very cold and overcast day? Man, I might have Teresa. I'm going to enjoy this for a moment, just like I always do. Anytime I get those rays of sunbeam coming in on me. Uh, maybe that's Teresa just saying... Thank you. Here I'm saying that I don't believe in psychics at all. And then I say that maybe these sunbeams are Teresa. Hey, I can believe what I want to believe. So, thank you, Teresa. Was there actual proof she was dropped off at the location? Camera footage from the police station. Christina, I don't think there is any camera footage back in 1978, even it being a police station. 
I would think the mismatched shoe would have DNA all over. Well, what Tanya, what type of DNA are you talking about? If you're talking touch DNA, what would it prove? We already know that the shoe came from the party, and I think they already identified who the shoe came from. So DNA is not even relevant. It is known for sure that the restaurant was open at 5 a.m. question mark. That seems a bit early. Yes, that's it was confirmed. Was there anyone at the party who worked at Penthouse 2? I, I don't know the answer to that. Man, look at those sunbeams coming in. Man, it's it's the when you get older, it's the little things that you look for in beauty. I would like to know who worked at that restaurant. If she was found a half mile from home, which is six blocks, makes me think somebody close to home saw her and took advantage of the situation. Somebody she knew her whole life. It's a good possibility. But you got you got to remember, I don't know. I have a hard time with 5.30 in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, somebody deciding to rape and kill somebody in the spur of the moment. I know it happens at all times, but I just have a hard time with it personally. Mary Kidd, maybe the guys came back and got her the prick who said her that they thought she's going to go to the cops. They went to find her. Well, that seems to be the consensus. Diane Wingate, were the eggs scrambled, fried, hard boiled, or deviled? I don't think there's any way to determine that, Diane. When you eat and you start to digest food, I don't think you're going to be able to tell whether they were scrambled, hard boiled, deviled. Uh, but even if, why would that matter? Goldie Khan, the lewds were in her stomach, question mark. Well, that's what I'm told from the autopsy report. Tina Lashi, my name is Teresa Corley. Wow, how weird. That is weird. And it's weird how these sunbeams are just beaming on me now. Wow. Mary Kidd again, were the drugs in the eggs? No idea. No way to determine that. Okay. Now, all those questions were from the Key Clue video. I'm going to go to the Deep Dive video and see if there's any different ones. Kelly Jansen. Wow, what a tough, sad case. She unfortunately got herself into a terrible situation by going to the presidential arms. I think it's one of the guys from the presidential arms, but the eggs just throw me off. Thank you for this one. You are my favorite. Well, thank you, Kelly. I appreciate that. And you you are portraying the exact scenario and situation and feelings that I feel. Um, that it seems like it's presidential arms, but the eggs are throwing me off as well. But it could be both. Right? It could be both. Maybe she did go to Maria's restaurant. Maybe she did eat the eggs. And maybe she did leave the restaurant and start walk, walking up towards Dairy Queen where she's seen by the three people carpooling. And after they pass, somebody from the presidential arms picks her up and, and kills her. Good possibility. So it could be both. <sighs> I have a feeling this girl wasn't taken to the police by the truck driver. I think he took her to the restaurant because he knew the place. I know we are all different, but if that had happened to me, my first thought would not have been a complaint, but to be with my mom, family as soon as possible. And that's true. I mean, the, the truck driver would have to be questioned as to, hey, why did you drop her off where you did? And I'm sure the police have that. They interviewed the guy. So I guarantee they have that information. We just We just don't know it.
Rain88, just one note. You mentioned that Teresa might have been hesitant to go into the police station because she had been drinking underage. Actually, the minimum drinking age in Massachusetts in 1978 was 18, so she was legal. They raised the drinking age to 18 just a couple months after her death, February 1979. Rainy, thank you. I did not know that. That's good info. So I guess my reasoning for her not going possibly going into the police station is faulty so i would correct that but she still may have been embarrassed and i said that in the earlier video as well maybe that's the reason or maybe she had no intention of reporting the assault it's amazing how you carry the destiny of people in your heart unique i wish the family perseverance and i hope one day a video will be made of the perpetrator being captured i hope that as well Sarek the Great. If the undigested egg evidence is true, my bet is that she ate at the restaurant, left it, or tries to leave, and was kidnapped between the restaurant and her place, which was nearby. Just my two cents. Another great video. And I think I just kind of went over that scenario. Laura Mead, here's a couple questions I have. Was there any other injuries beside the strangulation? I don't know. That's the only information that I have. I'd be interested to see if it was overkill or not. I, I don't believe so. I think it was just strictly strangulation. Whether it was defensive, there wasn't stab wounds or gunshot wounds from what I understand. It's just strangulation. Are, you sh are they sure that she died early that AM or not later on? No. I don't think that's been determined. I feel like if it was one of the guys from the party, someone would have let it slip by now. Well, and I think they kind of did. I got an email from a lady who said she was best, her husband was best friends with a guy named, I want to say Larry, who was at the presidential arms apartment that night in question. Larry told him that they, all the guys, Ronnie and another guy held her down why the rest of the guys raped her. So she said she gave that information to the police, but they just didn't seem like they were interested in it. I don't know the truth to it. I'm just telling you what was reported to me. To me, it matches. Kind of makes sense. So... Leah I curd I agree with your assessment that she was murdered by someone unknown to her the fact that her body was dumped off a major interstate with very little effort to conceal the body says that the offender was not worried about the body being found because there was no way to link the offender to the body a known offender would have made more of an effort to hide the body I'm with you all the way up and agree with you all the way up to the last sentence a known offender would have made more of an effort to hide her body Although that may be true, that's not the truth in every sense. So I, I do like your way of thinking there, and I tend to agree with you. Bridget Harrison, you just taught me something that, I, that will help me in Jason DeMello case. If someone says something and you can't find anyone to back that up, put it aside. You can't use it. Well, yes, put it aside. You, you can follow up on it if there's something there to follow up on. Um, but if no one else corroborates it, you have to put it on the back burner. You can't discard it completely. Just put it on the back burner until you can corroborate it. Just as blessed. I have a 19-year-old daughter myself and cannot even fathom something like this happening to her. This poor family. May they find answers and resolution someday. Thank you, Detective Maines. I agree. S. Fiddler. Possibly a delivery truck driver who supplies her work. She would feel comfortable in accepting a ride because she had a small talk with him at work or the guy who couldn't get it up. I guess he finally got it up as he was strangling her. I agree with your deductions. Jenna. Can you truly have a mind for detail and making reasonable connections? 
So cool how you brought up fo both face scratch stories here. Well, yeah, and I, I do that a lot. I try to, each case, if there's something that is relevant or not identical but similar to another case, you know, I think of both of them. So in this case, Greg Emmel being scratched and him saying well, it was from a flat tire and he got scratched by a jagger bush when I knew that was complete bullshit that it was the victim that scratched him. I would make the same logical conclusion in this case. The fact that the individual stated that he was having sex with Teresa Corley, she had an orgasm and scratched his face. Not only does that speak to a narcissistic personality um, who's telling the story, it's just, I don't want to get too personal, but I will say I've been in a situation multiple times, hopefully, if it wasn't being faked, and you know how many times I got scratched in the face? Zero. I call bullshit and he's would be circled in my suspect pool and he's who I'd be talking to again I'm going off of okay my limited experience in that realm or maybe vast amount of experience <laughs> I told you it was early in the morning Perplexing case. I agree with all your observations, detective. Thank you. My daughter lives in Bellingham now, so this case really intrigues me. I'd love to see this solved. Also, just remember this, and I've said this many times. It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. That's so very important. And that's from Denzel Washington, Training Day. When I was a detective... And even when I was a patrol cop, one of the best piece of advices that I got was work the case backwards. And I always did that. And what that means is if you're on scene, start thinking right away about trial. So think about what could be suppressed if, you, okay, let's say you see, you see a safe there. And you think more than likely a murder weapon is in that safe. You have a search warrant already for the property. So you're like, well, the safe's here. Let's open it up. But if you work backwards from the trial, you'll know that anything you get from that safe will be suppressed because although you have a search warrant for the entire house, you have to have a separate search warrant for the contents of that safe. So when you work it backwards, while you're there on the scene, now you know, hey, I got to go get a second search warrant. That's what it is to work it backwards. And so they may have this solved. They may know in their minds who did it. They may not have enough evidence. Maybe not. But a lot of cases are solved. It's just not what you know. It's what you can prove. MF. The last trucker may have lied about dropping her off at the police station unless there is video on it. Well, there's not going to be video on it um, in 1978. That's just not happening. But the guy was interviewed. So I think the police, on everything must have matched up. Or he certainly would be a major suspect. Could she, he have lied about dropping her off at the police station? I guess he could. RR, that was an excellent assessment. Thank you. Well, thank you for watching, RR. Uh, did she have money, purse, on her to buy food? Unknown. If not, that could rule out the restaurant unless she was offered a meal. The mismatched shoes could be from putting them on in the dark and the extra four hours may be her waiting for the men to fall asleep. They weren't allowing her to leave. Her only way home is to walk. That's a good possibility. You know, what's funny is I think 
Now, now that I'm thinking about that, these sunbeams come in. I, I don't get them on any other day. It's the question and answer period. If I if I'm remembering right, because this has happened like three weeks in a row now, maybe four. I don't know why I'm all caught up on these sunbeams. Because I am. It makes me happy. But it only happens on the question and answer period, I think. Weird. Hope and Jazz. One man lied about his inability to perform sexually. One man had a scratch on his face. Ronnie was on the brink of telling what he knew. Her comment of what she would do to be free to go. Looks like she was drugged and held against her will. Different shoes could point to her sneaking out in the dark with haste. All that's true. All that's true. All right, this is the last one here. My only question is, where did the quaaludes come in? Someone must know. I think she probably ate somewhere just to get something in her stomach and warm up. I agree with your conclusion, but I think those quaaludes are important to the case. And I think David did it so she wouldn't talk. Why else would he lie? Well, Peg, you're absolutely right. The quaaludes hold a, a very key um, aspect to this case. We don't know where they came from. That's one of the questions like we have in many uh, cases, unfortunately. It's one of two things. She, you know, she was given those quaaludes, you know, without her knowledge or her consent because they were like a date rape drug. Or she took them. You can't rule that out. As much as you want to rule that out, her victimology tells you you should probably rule that out because she had only smoked marijuana to that point that we know about. However... Being in her intoxicated state that she was does not mean that she would not take them willingly. So you have to take that in consideration. You can't automatically just assume that she was date raped with drugs, given date rape drugs, I should say. You can't assume that because you don't know. So you just have to look at the fact. And the fact, if true, she had quaaludes in her system. We don't know how they got there. You can surmise from here to Sunday. It doesn't make it true. All right. That's it for the questions and answers for Teresa Corley. I hope this helped out the family a little bit. Uh, that's my hope in all these cases is that it shines some light on the case for the victims and the victims' families. I almost end every video that way. Because that's what it's always about. Always about that. Make no mistake about it. It's always, always about the victim and the victim's families. So with that, I salute the victim and the victim's families. And they have my deepest, deepest condolences and respect. So until uh, next week, Maine's out.